My tutorial will be on advance, advances in combinatorial op optimization for graphical models. Uh, I would like to uh, convey to you uh, the body of work that was uh, done in the community of graphical models, probabilistic graphical models, deterministic graphical models <coughs> over the last, where are we now, uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, and the uh, uh, in our lab, uh, the work was uh, focused in general, in general algorithm for graphical models uh, and optimization algorithm are one class, important class. And I will focus on optimization algorithms, but I also will give a glimpse of other tasks which are very related to um, <coughs> planning and reasoning in general. I really would appreciate questions. Please ask me questions. So I will tune myself to the audience. Um, so let's start right away. Uh, this is the outline. This is my plan. Uh, I will give you a general uh, introduction about graphical models uh, and the variety of tasks and the general principles that are govern exact algorithms for uh, solving graphical models and also approximation algorithms that are focused on a particular uh, uh, schemes that exploit primarily the graph structure. You can exploit when you want to do reasoning, you can exploit the structure of the problem. The structure of the problem can be uh, divided into the structure of the graph, the abstract structure that is provided by the graph, and also the structure of the function themselves. The focus of uh, uh, the principles that I will give you today exploit the, the, the graph primarily, I will hint on other ideas. <coughs> so, uh, uh, so I will start with some introduction, give you a, a brief overview, and then uh, I will talk about two primary ways of uh, reasoning or uh, so problem solving, which are called, can be called inference type and search types, and they are hybrids. Uh, so once uh, I, uh, we, I will cover that, I think we will be in the break, maybe uh, not, and then I will move to approximation algorithms. Approximation algorithms that focus on uh, methods that give you a lower and upper bound on whatever you want to compute. And those methods that give you lower and upper bounds can be really in integrated with the exact algorithms to, pro to yield any time algorithms. Namely algorithms that you can terminate at any point and they will give you a better and better solution as, as you have more time. And the interaction between the, these bounding schemes and search uh, is in the traditional way of heuristic search methods. Namely, the bounding schemes are exploited as heuristic evaluation function within search. Uh, and then I will move to uh, tasks. I will talk, uh, as time permits, about tasks that are moderately uh, relevant to planning uh, in the graphical model, which are marginal maps, influence diagram, and conclude with some um, this uh, talk about our software and experiments. Any questions? Okay, so applications, I mean, it's good to really uh, ground ourselves in uh, and mention that there are many, many applications. Here, uh, 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 just visualization of uh, scheduling, finding an optimal schedule for the satellite that maximizes the number of photographs taken, subject to onboard recording capacity, another task is how much to invest in each asset uh, to, to uh, earn eight cents or something in investment. Uh, uh, applications, we have application in communication, assigning a frequency to, radio to radios that needs to communicate without interference, and, and many applications in bioinformatics. Uh, in this case, you want to find uh, joint haplotypes, uh, configuration that is uh, uh, consistent with the data. And there are many, many more. Uh, here is one uh, application we uh, worked on early on in constraint optimization. You want to, <coughs> to decide on uh, a, in power plants on how, uh, which nuclear uh, uh, to, uh, uh, lines to really put on and off over the week so that you will uh, uh, be able to satisfy the demand and maximize and minimize the total cost. Uh, here you, already, you really see the explicit graph that can be 
uh, the graphical model that can be used to really uh, uh, model this problem uh, with the constraints. So these are just a few examples, and in planning there are many, many examples, and I will try uh, as I'm uh, doing the tutorial to really uh, connect with particular particular models of planning that uh, is the motivation of this conference. So here is just the general definition of a graphical model and of a constraint optimization problem. So in, in a graphical model, we have three components. We have the variables. The variables are defined on discrete domains. We assume discrete domains in this uh, tutorial and a collection of functions. The functions, the assumption is that they are defined on small scopes in general. So on small subset of variables, but we can also have global function or functions on large scopes. The power of the techniques is often exploiting the fact that you have functions on a small subset of variables. And the function is just a table, can be also described by other means, but uh, the, uh, the, mo the general assumption is that you have a table that for any assignment of values of the domains of the variables, you have a cost. So this is a particular example of a function. And we, given a graphical model with a collection of functions, we will associate it with a graph. Sometimes it's called a primal graph, uh, where the variables are nodes. And the functions are, uh, if you have a function over a set of variables, you connect all of them in the primal graph. So in this particular example, uh, uh, what, and then the, the, the semantic of this collection of functions is their sum or their product. So they represent a, a global function that we want, uh, uh, in our case, mostly to optimize, to find an assignment that will uh, give us the maximum uh, global function. So this is the setup that I will assume. <coughs> and here in this example, you have this function of three, uh, a global function which compose of three smaller functions, and this would be the primal graph associated with it, because uh, a, a, B, and D, A, B, and D are connected because they appear in this function, D, F, and G are connected because they appear, D, F, G are connected, and so on. So the information in the graph is the missing R. C and D are not connected. It means that there is no single function that is defined on both of them. Maybe it's a typo, and it shouldn't. Uh, I, I think it's a typo. I, I, uh, you're right. I don't see A and C in any of these scopes. D uh, and F, other than that, I think it's, so it's a, it's a typo. Good point. OK. So here are some examples from some specific graphical model. One, the, a, a simple graphical model is constraint network. Uh, when you have uh, a collection of variables and a, a collection of constraints and you want to find an assignment uh, that satisfies all the constraints or you want to count all the solutions, so uh, this is the graphical, uh, the uh, map coloring problem. Uh, uh, we can model the countries. If we want, uh, if we have a map and we want to uh, uh, color each country by a color such that adjacent countries will have different colors, the countries are the variables, the colors are the uh, domains of the variables, so th they all have the same domains, and the constraints are not equal constraints between adjacent countries. S uh, just a second. Yeah. So a constraint in this case is a relation. Uh, the function that is associated is a relation where you can just denote the combination of pairs of values that are allowed uh, in the relation, and those that do not appear in the relation are not allowed. And the solution is a coloring, and the constraint graph, which is a, uh, another name for the primal graph in this domain, is a, a exactly as I defined before. It's denoted here and here. So you don't have an arc if there is no explicit constraints between the uh, uh, variables. Okay. Uh, in, the con in the constraint case, um, normally the task is to find a solution, to count solutions, and et cetera, and to really even uh, answer the, qu the question whether there exists a solution, so the consistency question. 
Uh, and uh, the next uh, graphical model is probabilistic networks, where we want to model probability distribution. And <coughs> so it's a directed acyclic graph between entities of interest when the directionality try to convey causal relationship, correlational relationship. And in this particular case, you have smoking, cancer, and some uh, uh, symptoms of these diseases that are connected in that fashion. And you associate, uh, you quantify the links or the by functions between a child variable and all its parents. So uh, in this case, you will have a function associated with each variable. And with each variable, it will be, the scope will be the variable and its parents. So in particular, for this uh, function over D, dysphenia, the symptom of bronchitis and cancer, you will have this conditional probability table uh, describing the probability of D given uh, C and B. So for every assignment to C and B, uh, there will be a probability, what is the probability that D equals 0 or D equals 1? The probability sums to 1. So you will have such a table with each one of these uh, functions. And what it means, the global function, so we have a collection of functions, and they mean the semantic is a joint probability distribution, which is the product of all these functions. And now that we have this semantics, we can ask any query. In particular, the queries that are, uh, will be of interest are uh, here more than others is the most probable explanation. Find the maximum probability assignment given evidence to all the variables. It's also called MAP, maximum a posteriori hypothesis. It's, uh, uh, there is a, a, a confusion in the community. Uh, the MAP terminology, in, in it's also in statistics, is uh, wi winning. Uh, and uh, uh, it's normally called MAP, the, this task that, that, that I described, in contrast to another task, which is the marginal MAP. Uh, map used to be marginal map, and the marginal map is a task that I will talk uh, uh, about it more later, where you are interested not in an assignment to all the variables that uh, um, uh, has a maximum probability, but an assignment to a subset of variables that has a maximum probability. And technically, it would mean that you need to really uh, project project the probability distribution on a subset of variable which involves summation and so on. So I will use the notion of MPE or MAP interchangeably. And if when I would want to talk about this other more complex stats, I will say marginal MAP. But these slides are uh, relatively, uh, I didn't, I, it's, a, it's a real confusion. You will find books where they talk about MPE. In Perl's original book, that's how he called the, the task. Uh, in more modern books, it's uh, uh, the people who are doing uh, learning and the, the tradition is statistics, this task is called MAP. And this is, here is just a, a, some example, uh, just to uh, give you the feeling of uh, a, a Bayesian network that try to monitor some uh, uh, intensive care patient domain. So the point of this slide is just to show that we can describe uh, probabilistic functions on many variables that had we want to really describe a, a one table with a probabilistic table on all these variables, we would need uh, 2 to the power of 37 parameters, a joint probability distribution. What this gives you is ability to uh, have a sparse representation with only five or nine parameters. And that's the power in terms of specification of Bayesian networks and all these graphical models, probabilistic graphical models, a Markov network, and so on. Okay, so, and we can have uh, other, uh, in general, we can have also uh, uh, domains where you want to express both probabilistic information and constraints. Uh, it's possible to do it just within the probabilistic language itself. We can have probability tables that are zero, one, which effectively model constraints. But it's also uh, useful to think about constraints, which are particular creatures, and they call for particular algorithms separately, both from the user points of view in specification and 
for uh, the algorithms to make the point here I have a particular kind of functions. And this is an example where I'm talking not only about the graph but the type of functions. So you can, you can uh, uh, especially in planning when you have probabilistic information, also po uh, information about the constraints of people operating in this probabilistic domain, operation of people is of often captured by a set of constraints. Uh, so it's useful to think about these two types of function and combine them and we can think about the mixed network as representing the probability distribution given by the Bayesian network, the probabilistic network, conditioned on all the constraints being true. And this is the te technically uh, how, what it stands for and it's just good to keep it in the back of the mind that we can represent it and it's a legitimate graphical model that calls for particular techniques and it's useful to have. Now, so for if this is the input then for constraint optimization you can treat you you know that you have determinism explicitly you know that you need to do constraint propagation, it will help you. So you can uh, do that directly. You can even do uh, constraint propagation algorithms on the constraint part before and, and discover that this is a tractable class for the constraint or that the, the number of solution is very small. So it's useful. Uh, and you can, if you have a, a CNF formula, it's a particular example of a constraints, Boolean constraints, you can also ask queries about what is the probability of a constraint expression uh, given this. So you can ask what is the probability that A or B is true and not C or D is true. And this uh, can, uh, and you can answer those queries. What I'm confused with is the interaction between the constraints and the probability. If you ask something like this, what is the probability of A or B and of uh, not C or D, then uh, you, you, it's not with external. These are the constraints, A or B and, yeah. and okay, yeah. not C or D. Yeah. So actually, the way to address it is you are, if you don't, if if you have constraints, it will be part of the background knowledge. But in addition, you will treat these three, these two as constraints, and then you will answer uh, the query uh, about those. It's like evidence. The, uh, this query is a an extension of the qu uh, question: What is the probability of a set of events given? So the set of events can be expressed not as just conjunction of simple atom atoms. Yeah. They can be expressed in a, as any, any Boolean formula. You can ask what its probability is, and it is more general. But if, if you know, I want to compute this, and I have additional constraints, yeah. then what is the meaning to what, what is the meaning of the, the how, how, how what is the semantics of okay. the Bayesian network combined with the constraints? So okay. we're not computing this uh, as like, like so, yeah, so I will, the, the, technically I will add this to the constraints and I will just ask what is the probability of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of this uh, set of constraints being true. Yes, yeah. Yes, okay. So this all can be worked out in a, with, with the constraints. I will not focus on that. I, I should say up front uh, in this uh, tutorial on this issue, but it's in, in the background we know that we can bring in once we define what is the meaning of each query, we can uh, answer and we can employ uh, constraint processing ideas. Uh, and the influence diagram in particular uh, 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 put it here because uh, this is a, a model that is very relevant to probabilistic uh, planning. MDPs, MDPs, so we have not only, we have uh, two types of variables, uh, chance variables and decision variables and probabilistic function and utility components. Uh, this is the, the general way of depicting it. And in this case, we would want uh, to uh, find an assignment to the decision variable that maximize the expected utility. And this is a very well-known graphical model. I will not focus it on it in particular, but it's all good to keep in mind that all the techniques that I'm going to show to you today are immediately applicable to all these graphical models, uh, both in the case of optimization and the case when we, uh, things involve summation. At the end, I will talk a little bit about this. So this is the query that we want to, we want to find optimal policy. That it can be expressed this way. So all in all, a graphical model can be is just 
this triplet of variables, domains, and functions, and the functions can be CPTs or relations or costs, and they all can, uh, the abs on the abstract layer, they are all unified by this graph. The same, the definition of the graph is the same, even in the case of influence diagram, we can give a definition that will capture the, what depends on what. And this, kept, this will help us uh, to uh, uh, devise algorithms. The operators that combine the functions are combination, which can be sum or product, or, uh, and, the, and we also have a way of projecting the global function into, onto a subset of variables, and it, this depends on the task that we are interested in, by an operator that is called elimination, that can be a, a optimization or summation. And we can, we can define all these tasks that I mentioned, some of them, using these two operations of combination and projection that really shows how these things are uh, the same. And we know that all of these are hard, and we want to exploit the structure of the problem, identify special cases of tractability, to really understand when things are tractable, and uh, when they are not, we want to uh, resort to approximation. Yeah. That's good. No, no, I like questions. When you, when you, uh, the graph, uh, loses, the graph doesn't have all the information about the structure of the function, you need a hypergraph. Yes. Is it, is, uh, and I know the algorithms don't explain this graph, but are there algorithms that actually, or something that looks at the hypergraph? Uh, yes. So there could be methods, especially in constraint processing, there, could, there are methods that will exploit the hypergraph more. The hypergraph is more, has more information than the primal graph. Uh, yes, so you can, in some cases, uh, in constraint processing, you, uh, there are even concepts that uh, uh, the notion of hyper tree width, that also this is distinct from tree width, and you can, uh, with this notion, really show that there is additional tractability expressed in this in the hyper tree width and not uh, that is not captured by the tree width it doesn't go to, to probabilistic function it doesn't go to cost functions that are more than constraints uh, uh, yeah in, in, the, in some in, at some level of details it would make a difference to think about the hyper graph but in most cases the, the primal graph itself is sufficient for what we want to capture so indeed, what we don't capture in the primal graph is whether we have a function on pairs of variables here or it's a function on a triplet. This information is not depicted here. And uh, probabilistic inference tasks, uh, uh, these are I already mentioned, uh, specifically one in, in probabilistic uh, uh, queries we are interested often in a belief of posterior probability. We want to compute what is the probability of evidence, a collection of effects. Uh, it's sometimes called also the partition function. And uh, we want the posterior. Given uh, evidence, we want to know what is the probability of a uh, uh, single variable given the evidence. Most probable explanation, as I mentioned, uh, we want to find, given evidence, the assignment that maximizes the probability. Marginal map is when you are interested only in a subset of variables and you are want to know what is the uh, assignment to this subset of variables called hypothesis variable that max maximize the probability and it involves both summation and maximization and maximum expected utility as I mentioned before which is also more involved. So in the most part of the talk I will focus on this query and maybe on this query as well, mention it because it's very easy to extend everything to this belief query. And towards the end, I will talk more about marginal map and maximum expected utility. And just to connect, I mean, here is a uh, dynamic belief network. It's often uh, capture problems in, uh, in, in planning. It's just an extension of an influence diagram to uh, a, 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 a planning task. And so all the techniques that we are that I'm uh, going to describe uh, it can be extended to planning. Some of them, uh, we are in particular try to do it nowadays. And other people, if you look at the techniques, you can see a lot of commonality. So the Burns view of algorithms, all the algorithms that I will talk about uh, can be described quite simply uh, as uh, uh, two types, either search or inference or a hybrid. So search is what you know. I mean, we do best first search, depth first search, 
And that search seems like not really very appealing, exponentially in the number of variables, but we will see that it's possible to do better. The other class of algorithm, so the search is here, and the other class of algorithm is variable elimination or inference, variable elimination being a special case. And what's nice about it, it comes immediately with a uh, worst case uh, time bound exponential in the tree width, time and space. This is what I will show. Uh, but we can exploit the structure also in search. This is an endo search that I will talk about significantly. And it can also allow us to exploit uh, the, this, the, the uh, memory in uh, an efficient, effectively. Uh, and everything boils down, comes from, uh, starts from the, uh, the observation that if you have a, a graphical model whose primal graph does not have cycles, you can answer all the queries, almost. All the queries that we talked about in, in linear time and space. And that's the power of everything you can think of. Uh, so uh, if I have this is here, I, in this example, it's a probabilistic network. If I want to find whether uh, there is a consistent solution or even to count the number of, so, of solutions or to solve an optimization or a summation problem, uh, we can do it simply by some, can be described as message passing uh, between this graph going up and down. And this is uh, the well-known belief propagation algorithm that many of you probably have heard of, and so on. So this is what gives graphical model, uh, I think, the power that they have uh, uh, algorithmically. Everything else is trying, uh, uh, so this leads to algorithms that are trying to uh, exploit the stru uh, a tree structure, even if things are not really tree. So if we have a graph, we normally uh, transform it into a tree of cluster. This is uh, the inference algorithm, that's what they do. And actually, the tree width parameter that I mentioned is just capturing the size of the clusters that you have to have in these three decomposition methods. Search looks bad at first. Search means you enumerate all the configuration of the variables and you just traverse the search space in order to answer the queries. Uh, and we, it has a good, one good thing, which you can do it in linear space. All these methods of inference require memory, memory exponential in the tree width. Uh, and the uh, search, you can do depths for search, uh, uh, and you can uh, answer the query. And there are methods that will just combine the two. You do search up to a certain level, and then you do inference on the condition subproblem, and you can play with some parameters that will govern how you divide this. And, uh, and in this way, you can trade off memory and time in an eff effective way. This is what search will look at the end of this tutorial. Search is not just on this exponential search space. It's we can compact the search space into end or graph. And this, if we are doing search on this graph, we are doing things far more effectively. And we still have much of the benefits of search. So uh, that's a general picture of all the algorithms that I will describe here. Uh, the exact algorithms. And on top of that, we can now relax certain properties and do approximation, and, but also think about the approximation as we can approximate inference, we are going to approximate search, and we can do a variety of hybrids. And uh, <coughs> just before I'm concluding this introductory part, it's interesting to observe what search and what a inference do to the graph when we are manipulating the problem. Uh, when, we are, when we are doing an inference, and we will see that, so think about this as a graph, and we are trying to infer what A imposes on the rest of the variables. Graphically, we will, we, will imp we will generate some function, new functions, and the function will be a function on other variables, so we are moving from this graph to this graph. Uh, we connect all the uh, neighbors of A. We are remaining moving from this problem to this problem that has more connectivity. This is the basic step graphically that we see when we are doing inference. On the other hand, search or conditioning when you are 
reasoning about a variable you are conditioning. You are saying A equals 0 or A equals 1. Let's reason on each one of these separately. So we are dividing the graphical model into a collection of graphical models. Each one of them is sparser. And we are solving each one of them. And this graphically really gives the essence of the difference between the methods and uh, uh, also uh, allows us to, to analyze uh, the properties, the complexity of the methods. So this was the introduction. And now I will go into the details. Any questions? Okay. How many of you are very familiar with all this? I, I never know if people have a background or not have a background on this. So this is new to most of you? Uh, uh, is it new to most of you? <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK, so I, because I can go slow or fast, and uh, if you will ask a question or you will give me some feedback, I will get into more details. Otherwise, I may tend to go too fast. So I will now, what we are going to do now to go to the inference part, part of uh, algorithm, is, and later on we will go to search, as I said, inference. And inference is variable. Inference. We'll uh, okay. add to uh, Yeah. Yeah so, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see an example of probabilistic reasoning. Based on all the experience that we have about uh, what it means to have that, we know that it indicates the emergency, but we also have the already an updated information in our mind about, uh, most likely, the posterior, it's nothing. But we should keep in mind that it may not be. Anyway, uh, but th so this is a. Uh, uh, an example for Bayesian network that they are trying, that's what Bayesian network, probabilistic networks are trying to capture, the ability to update uh, the, the posterior probability given evidence. Uh, so uh, bucket elimination is a particular algorithm, it's a variable elimination algorithm, and it's an example of inference. Uh, it it captures everything, and let's, let's go right into it. So if I have, in this case, it can be a constraint graph, or it can be a, a it can be a probabilistic network. In a, uh, I define to you a probabilistic network, a directed probabilistic network. This is one type of uh, base, uh, probabilistic network, which are called also Bayesian network. Another is when the probabilistic information is just undirected. You have just some functions on pairs of variables or triplets, and you take the product and normalize. Namely, you make it, you impose on it a probability distribution by normalization. Or this can be a Bayesian network when you connect the parents and you forget about the directionality. It's also called the moral graph. Or it can be just a, a, a cost network where you have a collection of functions, in this case on pairs of variables, and you would want to uh, optimize their sum. This is the task, and maybe one of the value variables have a value 0. So if we are trying to solve this problem, we observe immediately the following uh, thing. We observe that certain various functions include variable b, and other functions do not include variable b. So we can minimize uh, on b first, and we can collect all the functions that mention b, and minimize on b. And we generate another function that is defined on all the rest of the variables that uh, capture this cost to go, the optimal cost to go for each assignment to ADCE. This is a table. It's the best assignment, uh, it's an assignment that minimizes over B. And we can do that first. And then ne the next thing, we will minimize over C. So we are doing it in sequence. So we will have this function. And now we will minimize over this sum. And we will generate another function. And at the end, we will minimize over d, and we will get the answer. So when we are doing this minimization of these variables, it's like variable elimination. Because we are taking functions that mention a variable, and by, by, by minimizing over b, we are removing this. We are generating a new function, and we are removing this variable b from uh, the problem. So we are projecting the problem on a smaller subset of variables, but it's the same problem. It captures the same meaning. So this is uh, uh, this, this ability to distribute it 
summation and minimization freely gives us effective, uh, uh, an effective way to do the computation. We can do it uh, you, and organize the information in a bucket data structure. So here it's the same thing. It's, by the way, the well-known dynamic programming algorithm, non-serial dynamic programming that was introduced by Bertel and Brioche in 1973, and it was rediscovered many times. It was also discovered by me uh, in constraints and uh, later on in optimization. So it's, it's well known. The, the, the uh, a good uh, feature, I think, that uh, um, is introduced in, in the buckets is this data structure bucket that allows us to capture the complexity. So if we are processing the variable in the order B, C, D, E, and A, what we should do in order to capture this uh, 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 variable elimination in stage, we should take all the functions that mention the top variable. So the ordering is from bottom to top, but we process from top to bottom, and we put all the functions that mention B in the bucket of B, from the remaining the functions that mention C in the bucket of C, the function that mentioned D in D, and that's the initial partition into buckets is what you see in blue here. And all you do now is you are solving the minimization problem in each bucket separately. So first we sum and minimize over B, processing only the first bucket. And this, in this particular case, creates a function on A, D, C, and E. Since we have bucket C next, we will put this function in the bucket of C. And now we will process this bucket. It will generate, we will sum and minimize over C. It will create a function over A, D, and E. It's a table. And then we continue now with the D. We will sum and generate a function over A and E. Here we will assign a value. We will get this. And here, we, by minimizing over A, this is a function on A only, we get the cost of the optimal solution. So this is the variable elimination algorithm. Bucket elimination algorithm is a particular variant of it that makes use of this bucket data structure. So that's the algorithm. What we do with it? After we find an optimal solution, we still want to find the actual assignment. We can do that by consulting these functions that we generated going from top to bottom have a meaning. They, they say what is the best cost to go upward. So this, this function says that there is the best cost, a, a, a way uh, of optimizing uh, these functions by, a, by just consulting these functions and these functions. So here is an illustration to what I mean. So to generate a tuple that is uh, optimal, we, g we look here and we choose A that maximizes this, this new function. So A will be argmin of this function. And then given that selection in E, we have a particular assignment, so we just choose, choose it. And when we go here, we have these two functions. We take their sum. And for the assignment, these two assignments, we find an assignment of D that minimizes this sum and so on. And by going up, one pass up, we are generating the optimal solution. So we can think about these functions as if they are exact uh, we are actually doing a greedy algorithm. We are finding an optimal solution by a greedy algorithm that, go, uh, that does the assignment in this direction. And this function is, can be viewed as exact heuristic evaluation function. They are telling us exactly uh, what, how to assign values in an optimal way. So variable elimination create an exact uh, heuristic evaluation function, and I will come back to it later on. Here is just an illustration what are these uh, uh, operations that we are doing, just to make sure that uh, writing function and saying we take the sum and take the product and minimize, sometimes uh, uh, people lose the, the, the really operation that we are doing. So in, in, in this case, suppose we have these two functions on A, B, and uh, on B, C, and you want to sum them, this is the function that you get. So uh, a function on A, B, uh, this is B, G, and this is GG, so the BGG is the sum of 6 plus 0, and you have the 6, just to make sure it's trivial. But this is the intermediate function that is generated by taking the sum of these two functions. And if we want then to minimize the elimination, 
we are, and we want to minimize over b, let's say, it means that we are looking at uh, a equal b, and we are taking the minimum value on all the possibility of b, which will be, in this case, 1, and so on. And so the projection, the minimization over b, takes this function on two variables, generate a function on a single variable, and this is what it means. So this will be the functions that I'm recording, generating moving from one bucket to another bucket. Complexity. So what is the complexity of this thing that we did? Is it exponential in the number of variables? I hope you, in this particular example, actually, it's not far from that. But you, can, you could see that there is the ability, we are solving one subproblem at a time. And if the subproblems are not big, we are gaining. And the parameter that captures this gain is uh, uh, called the induced width of three width, and I'm defining it now. So uh, given, and it can be defined directly on the graph without thinking about what we are doing it, with it, and it's a very well-known graph parameter that is capturing many interesting things. So if we have this graph, we can order it. As you noted, we are ordering the variables, processing them in some manner. So when we are... Uh, I think I had it, uh, let me see if I had it in the, uh, sorry, go back. Yeah, I forgot to relate to this. Uh, uh, actually, the graph is already here. You saw that uh, here I have the, this is the processing of the variable, this is the processing, this is the graph in this order, and we ju I just put the arcs, this, the, the solid arcs are the arcs of the primal graph, and you can see that F, when I'm processing the bucket of B, I, the number of vari the complexity is the number of variables that I have uh, in this bucket. I, wi I will let you ask question. The number of variables here, and I have to solve a problem uh, that has this uh, four variables, so it will be exponential in four. By looking at the graph and the number of back edges, I can see what this number of variables would be. So this is called the width of B. The width of B is four because there are four arcs going back. The width, but when I'm recording a function, I'm generating a new connection. So we will have to connect all the variables here. And this amounts to connecting all the uh, earlier neighbors of B. So all the earlier of neighbors of B, if they were not connected, we are connecting them. And now when we go to C, we see three back arcs. It means that there are three variables when we process C or four. It's always, there is a, a, a the, the induced width is just capturing the number of variables minus one, and so on. So this graph, the, we call it an ordered graph, by connecting the parents in the graph and by counting how many back arcs we have, we are capturing the complexity. And you had a question? Maybe I'm missing something, but I don't see the proof that it really works. Uh, the, the, the algorithm works? Okay, so if it's possible, it's easy to prove that it were um, easy. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively easy uh, to prove that variable elimination works. I mean, the the intuition that I gave at the beginning should be the the argument. So I I showed that we are just doing the minimization in stages, and the bucket elimination is just mimicking this. So we know that we can distribute summation over minimization. So it's okay when you minimize over a collection of variables to minimize over one variable first, take the result, capture the result by remembering the results, and then capture on a, a minimize over the next variable and the next variable. So that's the proof. So I'm just doing it in a like, little bit of a clever way. That's all. It's, the, uh, it's well known it's this idea of dynamic programming as well. But if, uh, if it's not convincing, I can talk about it later. But this, this is the proof. Um, so going, I want to go back to the complexity, to the induced width. So here is how it is defined graphically. So I have a, a graph. I take the ordered graph. And uh, these are the arcs in the graph that are in the ordered graph. And uh, the width of a node is the number of back edges that are going from the nodes uh, to earlier variable. But we take the induced order graph is the graph where I am taking and connecting the parents of each node. So I'm connecting the parents of B with this additional arc. I, then I will connect the parents of C 
the parents of D and the parents of E, and this will be the induced graph. In this induced graph, I am counting how many back edges each node has, and the maximum is the induced width of this ordering. So you can see that here I have a variable who, that has four arcs going backwards, then the induced width of this arc, this ordering is four. I could, do, I could choose a different ordering. I could choose the, this ordering, E, D, C, B, A. That's a perfectly legal different ordering. I, can ha I have a freedom that in the ordering that I'm choosing. If I chose this ordering, the graph will look, the ordered graph will look this way. You can see that now if, I'm, if I process E, it has only two arcs going backwards and I may need to connect C and B, but in this case they are already connected. Then I am uh, processing D, I have to connect B and E, A, and they are already connected. So the, uh, the ordered graph and the induced ordered graph are the same in this case, and the induced width is only two, right? So the induced width of a primal graph along ordering D is just, uh, on each ordering it can be different. And obviously we want the ordering which will minimize the induced width because you, I, I didn't illustrate it directly, but you can imagine that if I did the variable elimination algorithm and I uh, started with E, E has just two functions, CE and, C, uh, and BE, I will generate a function only on BC and so on. The, the processing will be only exponential in two and not in four, right? So the ordering matters a lot. I chose a very bad ordering for illustration we can see different orderings. And finding the minimum uh, induced width, you can imagine, is not easy. So all, almost all the problems, uh, even graphical properties that we encounter, are always to find the best one is NP complete. Uh, but it's a really uh, a very easy to really have some greedy algorithm or some approximation algorithm and to verify whether what is the induced width of your ordering a priori. So a priori you know for a candidate ordering what will be the complexity of, of doing this bucket elimination algorithm. So the complexity is this, exponential, each bucket is exponential, it's, we have to solve a problem, the domain is K, will be exponential in the induced width. This is a W star, the induced width along the ordering D. Uh, we have here another parameter, which is the functions. And actually, it's, we have to take also the number of functions that we have in a bucket. So it's linear in the number of functions that we have in a bucket. Is this uh, convincing? Yes? OK. So this is the algorithm. So we have something that is very pleasant. We have a very straightforward algorithm that uh, if the problem is sparse enough, we can solve it. And you can see immediately the memory. This is time and space because we are generating these functions and, it, uh, and this is the memory. And this it's exponential in the induced width. Now, the induced width, uh, uh, when we process the number of variables in a bucket is W star plus one. The function that we are generating is has a uh, w star arguments in it. And it, this parameter is identical to the tree width. If you heard about tree width, it's the same parameter. Okay, here I will just give you uh, an illustration of that everything is the same when you are trying to solve other problems. Here is an example for summation query. So we are interested in optimization primarily, but uh, summation is a very hard query, actually harder than uh, optimization. And let's assume that we want to compute what is the pro posterior probability of X given evidence, or even the probability of some evidence. So here is an illustration on a similar graph, actually same. Uh, let's, let's assume that you have probabilistic function. This is the moral graph or primal graph of a, of a probabilistic network. And uh, to compute the probability of A given evidence, E equals zero, is just by definition we want to assign E0 and to sum over the rest of the variables. That's by definition the task. And because uh, it doesn't matter to this method that I mentioned whether there was a summation or minimization here, the same logic applies. We can sum first. I mean, we want to sum over all the variables. We can sum first on B. It will generate a function on the rest of the variables and we can continue. It's the same algorithm, identical. 
algorithm. And it will look in the bucket stru data structure, it will look the same. I can just uh, pick an ordering. Again, I'm not picking the best ordering in the world. It's a bad ordering. And I'm just processing bucket by bucket. Uh, but the, uh, the operator, before I did uh, combine the function by, by summation and marginalized by minimization, here I'm combining the function by product. And I'm marginalizing, uh, projecting by summation over the, the bucket variable. But other than that, it, it is all the same. And we generate this function. It's like a message. A function is like a message that you send from one variable to, to another. And uh, you can see how that it is identical. And what you get at the bottom is actually the probability of the evidence. And also, you can compute the mar marginal, uh, prob uh, the, uh, the conditional probability is just the ratio between uh, uh, the, the summation that you compute here and summation of the probability of evidence, and you have an answer. And the complexity will be the same. It's the, the induced twist, W star is 4 here, the same complexity. Here we don't have this other pass that we need to generate the optimal solution because we are interested just by the posterior. But in this case, we are computing just the posterior of a single variable given evidence. There are advanced algorithms that extend this algorithm that we will be able to, with two uh, passes of this algorithm, we compute the posterior of each variable. And in this case, the, the uh, manipulation of the function is just the same. It's just product instead of summation. So. Uh, you, uh, to de get the product function and, and to marginalize, it's the same thing. Here is just a, a scheme of this bucket elimination algorithm for belief. So it's just to illustrate how simple it is. You just have to say what you do in each bucket after you partition the function into buckets in the this way. Even the ordering, you put only the functions that mention the top variable there and so on. You are just doing this operation, you take the product and you marginalize by summation and put the function in, it, in the right bucket and continue. So I will, at the end, talk about also this algorithm for marginal map, namely when some of the variables need to be processed by summation and the rest by uh, maximization, and influence diagram which is the finding the maximum expected utility. And just to say up front, this algorithm extends. And they all can be governed by, com by uh, complexity uh, that is dictated by the graph. And we know that we have to try to find good ordering. Any questions? Okay. So we are doing good. So all these graphical models, we can know well. Why, why are we so uh, desperate when we go to algorithm? It seems that this is not good enough. What's the problem? Why should I go to search? Memory. What? Memory. Memory. Memory when? Not only memory. Yeah, memory, but even time. I mean, if the induced width is big, there's nothing we can do. So memory, we can even not even run the algorithm, but also time. So when the graph is too small, too dense, the tree width is, no matter what ordering you will choose, it will be high. And you cannot do it. And memory makes it completely invisible. Search will allow you to try and to wait for a long time, but it's at least we will not get stuck because of memory problem. So let's see what search can give us. So this is the same problem. I have a graphical model. The objective function here is a collection of f pairwise functions. And I want to take the sum and find an, uh, an optimal solution. This is a, the search tree. I, I can go and do depth first search, branch and bound algorithm on this uh, tree along this ordering that we have here. Uh, so what does it mean? It actually, we can convert this problem to search by uh, or, or pathfinding or uh, by putting some cost on the arcs. And the cost on the arcs will be, we will get just from the cost function. So if uh, uh, we have 0, 0, here 0, 0 is 2, we will put on this arc the cost 2. 
So we will take those numbers of the cost and, and we'll spread them on the arcs along the search tree in an obvious manner such that an assignment uh, 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 along, uh, for all the variables is a path and the sum of the cost on the arcs will correspond actually the sum of the cost of the function. That clear? It's, ob it's quite <coughs> straightforward. So now we, when we do this mapping we can just try to find an optimal path of this search tree. That's the idea. And we can do a depth first search. So you can see that depth first search is linear memory. So that's the potential. But uh, it can also be costly. So what I have here, in addition to what I had in the previous uh, uh, graph, is that I show that we can associate with each node in the graph a number, which is the best cost solution below it. So I know, uh, and we can compute it recursively by, by depth first search. Three here means that there is an extension of this assignment with minimal cost three. And once what we want is to compute the value of the root node, but it just illustrates that there we can do it recursively. The, uh, the value of a, a parent is the minimum value of its child node because we are looking for minimization. Okay. A solution is a path, uh, and we're looking for the minimal cost path. But we can do better than just this brute force search. We can exploit the structure also in search. So if, we ha if I have this uh, primal graph, I can generate an ordering using depth first search uh, traversal of this graph. Uh, I'm generating the depth first search tree of this graph. Uh, so here, uh, we have the tree uh, in red, and all the other arcs, the back arcs, are the rest of the arcs on this graph. And it's known that for, uh, if you do the depth first search traversal of a primal graph, you will get something like that and you will not get uh, arcs between branches and it's important. So let's now do search. Let's you let I will not get arcs between uh, different branches. A branch is a path. Okay. You, you don't get any, oh, okay. any arcs so crossing. Yeah, the, the arcs are only going back. In the same, in the same path. Yes, and that's a property of depth first search traversal of a graph. Uh, so it, I chose this traversal for a purpose because if I'm now assigning a value to A, it has two possible values, 0 and 1, let's say. And in, in this search space, I will denote the actual variable names uh, to make it clear. So you can see this is what happens. Uh, uh, once the variable is assigned, all, all the arcs from it to the rest of the variables are sort of can be removed the re from the rest of the problem. We still don't have any, any virtue by doing that. The next variable is b. We assign it to value 0 and 1. Up to now, it's the same as we had before. But what happened is because we already assigned this to value, the, the uh, uh, dependence, some dependencies disappear. And we have two sub-problems here. Given any assignment to A and B, given any assignment to A and B, you can see it also here, this subproblem and this subproblem are completely independent, and we want to capture it in the structure of the graph. We do that by end node. This end or uh, notion of graph is well known, so we say that this node is an end node. It has two subproblems, one rooted in E and one rooted in C. We, we pick this uh, ordering because this is what we have here, and this is the way for all the possible assignments to A and B. And this is an end node. We know we will solve it independently. And we continue in the same way. Now we assign to E and C. We assign them values, 0 and 1, 0 and 1 all the way. But when we do that, we see another decomposition. We see that F and D now are completely independent. F and D are completely independent when A, B, C are assigned. So for E, it's the end of the way. But for C, we will now have another end decomposition composition of D and F, D and F, for each one of the path. And for each one of these, we will have the two values, zeros and 0 and 1. So this is the end or search tree of this problem that we saw before. And you can see that I have, uh, I have less assignments, or the tree is sparser. The, first of all, the depth of the number of combination of assignments is not more than 4, the depth of the DFS tree. If we look side by side on the OR tree, now we call this OR because there is no decom end decomposition, uh, and the end OR, 
And we, if you ignore the fact that we actually depict the variable names, here the variable names are implicit in the ordering, then this one has depth 4, this one has depth 6. Obviously, uh, we have a smaller tree. We have 54 nodes here, 126 here. Obviously, the search, this search tree captures all the so same solutions. It has less nodes. It will allow us to do things more effectively. And uh, everything, that all, the all the problems that we will solve will become exponential only in the height of this tree. And we can do still things in linear space. We can do depth <coughs> research and so on. So we are immediately without any cost, we are moving from things that are exponential, bound exponential in the in n, the number of variables, to being exponential only in the height of this, what we will call later pseudo tree. Yes. So. Uh, yeah. No. So what this is saying is that the, we also know people uh, investigate this notion of pseudo the height, and it's known that the height give a, uh, there is a relationship between the tree width and the height. Namely, the height cannot be higher than log n times the tree width. It means that if we are now comparing back to variable elimination algorithms. In variable elimination algorithm, you can do things exponential in tree width. Here you can do things exponential in log n times the tree width, but with linear space. So we, we are gaining, we are, not, we are not able to do things as efficiently as the variable elimination, but definitely it's expo not exponential in n. Number of uh, functions. Number of functions. Functions. And here you have basically n squared times the Y n squared. Because the uh, exponential in log n is it, 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 n. And you have this n, uh, n on n times k to the h. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And what about these back edges? Do they, they don't so this. They, the, role, they, the role that they have is that in order to traverse it, you are consulting the functions that you have. And so each, uh, you can also, when we, you do detailed analysis, uh, generating, when you are doing depth research, the number of functions uh, are a parameter. So uh, you, you will have the number of functions as a linear uh, a parameter in this also. But it's just linear in the same way. So uh, here is again, side by side, the, the, the two search spaces. So we, you see in the end, oh, it's exponential in four, the height. Uh, here it's exponential in six. Uh, the other point is, what is a solution? So in this, it's an end or search tree. A solution is not a path. A solution is a subtree, a solution subtree, where uh, from, we call this or node. The, the, the variable names are or node. The assignment, when you assign a value to a variable, it's an end node because it may have decomposition. Sometimes it doesn't. And uh, a, a, the, end, the, the subtree has one uh, arc emanating, a solution subtree has one arc emanating from an OR node, but it must include the two arcs emanating from an end node. And this would be the solution subtree, in a, a, a solution subtree here, while here it's a path. So uh, we capture many more, uh, in, with the compact structure, we, kept, we can capture many more solutions because we are exploiting the parallelism or the independencies that we have in the original problem. OK, let me illustrate this, and then I will answer uh, uh, more questions. I think maybe later on all these questions may be clearer, but I can. Uh, here is just an illustration of how you will count the number of solutions of a constraint satisfaction problem that has this structure. So you can see you can do the depth first search. You go and you, go, uh, you compute the number of solutions uh, above, uh, below each. The value is the number of solutions below each uh, node. And we can, uh, when we go, for a end node will take the product because if I have two sub problems, each one has some solutions there and they are independent, the number of solutions below it is the product. So for example, here, zero means that the number of solutions below this is zero because uh, in one branch, under D, you, I have two solutions, but under F, I have zero solutions. So 
I have zero solutions under one. Here, I have two solutions below D, one solution below F, so uh, under Z, I have two. But we are doing, a, 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 so here we take again the sum and uh, so on. And we can count the number of solutions. The point is, we can now do it on a, a more compact structure, and the complexity that uh, uh, the size of this NO3 dictates what is the complexity of all this computation, and the memory in this particular case is linear. And this is now an illustration of the same thing, just for optimization before it was a summation. So here we have our previous example with uh, this pseudo tree. Uh, I think I, I, there is, uh, and now that I'm thinking there may be a missing slide, but I will connect it. I have a slide showing what is the connection, what are the collection of trees that, can, uh, that are legal. I'm not sure I have it on my set, but let, let's see. So here is another example. Uh, and again, here I have, this is the optimization problem. I take the costs from the functions, and they will be, uh, they can be defined from every OR node to an end node. I have these costs that are coming from here. And an end node, the combination operator is summation. I sum the, the cost of two subproblems. In OR node, the marginalization is minimization. So uh, here, for instance, B, uh, uh, we see that below the assignment, this assignment, I have the minimal cost is C. Below this assignment, the minimal cost is 5. But I have to take C plus 2. This will be the cost coming from this child. Here it will be 5 plus 0, which is 5, the cost coming from this child. And here I will do the minimization. It will be 5, and so on. So you can define recursively how you compute the value of each node based on the values of the child nodes. And it will be different for n nodes and for all nodes because of what they mean. OK, so what I will talk now is how to compact it further. So right now we saw how to compact it just by the decomposition. There is additional redundancy that can be gleaned from the structure that can compact it more from an end or search tree to a graph. Exposing that at all, so this could Just come on top of yeah. It could, it should come on top of that, and it should be possible to exploit, exploit all these ideas that they have on top of these ideas, and maybe some of them are also. Let's see. Uh, okay. So here I'm not assuming that I'm not exploiting the structure. I'm do not doing any context uh, sensitive independence at all. Just the graph, and obviously we should, but that's the first step. So. Uh, Why? Because when I will solve the problem coming from here, let's say that's for search and I explore all this, I want to remember it. And when I come here again, I don't want to do it again. I want to really pick up from the cache what I already did. So that's uh, definitely something we wish to have. And we often we have a lot of redundancy in such trees, but we, it's hard to recognize it. Certain redundancy is easy to recognize in graphical models, and that's what I will show. So suppose now I'm taking uh, the perfectly uh, this, this graphical model, this data nature. This is a possible uh, <coughs> a pseudo tree. The pseudo tree is a dexter search tree, but there are structures, there are additional structures that can allow me to do that. Here is one tree that will guide the search. And uh, this is the, the end of search tree. But if you look, you can recognize certain things. You can see that B, and 
and E, actually what, what, what goes on below them is completely captured by their veil. I mean, everything above them is not penetrating down. So actually, we can immediately recognize that uh, this sub, all the subtrees below D and all the subtrees below F are only dependent on the values of the D and the and the F and they are identical. Because there are no back edges or why? Are because they yeah, yeah. So because there are no edges from above D that goes either they go below D. Because in each part uh, and uh, this is the notion of context. So we, we define the notion of the context of the variables and uh, what it tries to capture is what are the ancestors of the variables that make the define that uh, uh, the determine the subtree below D. And if there are only, if not all of them, responsible for the structure below, you can recognize it and identify, uh, and based on that, you can uh, realize that actually certain uh, uh, variables can be, in the search tree can be merged. So this is what I'm heading towards. So here, this is just uh, the flavor of it. So we, so we intu intuitively, we will understand. We can do that because looking at the graph, we can make a, a, a determination that D depends only on, uh, that the structure below D depends only on 0 or 1. So all these arcs from all these places will merge into this. So we have this, and all of all this 0 here, and, and this 0 here, and this 0, and this 0 here. So all the zeros under D will become a single node. All the ones under B become a single node, and likewise for M. And that's what, how we get. So if I have that, that's great, because I can search a smaller space. And this leads to the notion of context. How do we do it? This is something we can do while searching and by reasoning from the graph. And it's uh, based on the notion of the context that captures what I was just saying. So a context of X, of, the, of a variable, is the ancestors of x in the pseudo tree that are connected to x or to the descendants of x. And because I think I didn't, I don't have a slide uh, on the pseudo trees. Do you have markers? OK, let me try to say things. Uh, I, I, I jumped from talking about DFS trees. Ah. <laughs> I jumped from talking about DFS trees to talking about, is it okay? It's okay? I jumped from talking about uh, DFS trees to talking about pseudo trees because uh, there is a larger class of trees of a primal graph, okay, that can uh, uh, be legitimate for, um, for a, a, the end or the composition. So, I'm not sure, so, okay. Say A, B, C, and D. Okay, will this give me a decomposition? Uh, okay. Um, so uh, a, a DFS tree here may be a chain. Or I, actually, I can have a, a DFS tree. I can go from B to A and to D, and to C, and then, I, uh, and then I have a back arc from C to B. And then I can go from B, uh, let's do this F, uh, C, D, E, F, G, and then I can go from B to E, uh, to F, and to G, and then I have a back arc to be. This is a legitimate DFS tree that can decompose the problem. But I can do even better. I can go from A to B, and then I can jump to D, and then I could go, this will work, jump, um, no, I will do it. I will go from B to, uh, sorry, I will go from B to D. This will be a, an imaginary arc, and from D to A, from D to A, and then, uh, and then, I'm I'm confused here. 
Let's see. Let me see if I can find a better example. Okay, I don't want to to really change the the flow. Let me let maybe I'll do it after the break. Uh, I recreate the example. I don't know how I missed this slide. Let me uh, continue the way I started, but just say that pseudo tree is like a DFS tree, but it does. We have a larger classes of trees that are legitimate and can guide the uh, the and or search tree uh, beyond uh, a. DFS tree. Uh, and I will show example later on. But continuing with this here, let me continue with the notion of a context. So the context is the ancestor of X in the pseudo tree that are connected to X or to descendant of X. So here is il illustration. For each node, I will tell you what is the, uh, the context. So A, we always, A and B are the same, so the context of B is A. The context of E is A and B because uh, these are previous nodes that are connected to uh, E or to descendant of, of E. So we have A and B are descendant, are uh, context of E and C. This is not that interesting because it says everything be before is the context. It starts to be inter interesting here. D, you can see the D, and you can assume a, an additional uh, a, a, a graphical model below it because it's boring when this is the last node. But D is not dependent on A. Uh, you, it's dependent on C. It's dependent on B. But A does not influence at all the uh, whatever uh, search will appear bef below D. So the context of D is just B and C. The context of F is just A and E. And the context is what will be determ will determine uh, the uh, how we merge nodes. And the context visually uh, of f is just the previous variables of f that will uh, 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 separate the previous variables from f. That's on, you can see it on the graphical model this way. Um, here is an illustration for the uh, for this pseudo tree and for this context how we are moving from the tree to a graph so I'm looking at this uh, and de determining the the context is very easy once I decided what are what is the, my pseudo tree I have the arcs on the tree and the arcs the back arcs I, the rule is very simple so I can have this uh, a context de determined and now what it means is that if I'm looking at this search tree, I'm traversing it. When I go to D, the context of D is B and C. It means that D depends only on the assignment of B and C and not on A. So I know that I can, uh, the, the subtree below D that comes from this path is identical to the subtree below uh, uh, D coming from this path when A, only the value of A is changed. So. Uh, this immediately during search, realizing the context will allow us to determine uh, whether we have a merging. What does it mean to have a merging? So I can describe it to you. But it means that if I am solving the problem once, I have to cache. I have to, uh, to cache based on the context. I know that uh, the, the solution below D depends on the context, which are the variables B and C, and each value of them, I will have a different subtree below them. So I can have a table that is uh, indexed by the, the context variables, and for each of their values, while I'm searching, I will put in the solutions that I find. So when I'm going this way and solve the problem below D, under the context 0, 0, I will write a number so that when I'm coming this way, I will just pick, get the number from the table. And when I will get to this D, I will fill the table from, uh, which, which will be 0, 1. Uh, I will fill uh, this other row and so on. So while we are searching for whatever we are searching for any value, we fill these cache tables if, that are indexed by their context. And this may raise a question. What is the question? So it's good to have small, smaller search graphs. But when we, what? Can we yes. So first of all, it's memory. I'm now. I was really bragging about 
search that the memory is great. But now I'm moving, uh, I'm doing search on a search graph. And when you search a graph, you have to do caching. That's the meaning of a graph. I mean, that you are not duplicating uh, uh, explorations. You have to use memory to record solutions so that you can pick them up next time and not resolve. The size of the tables is exponential in the size of the context. So you can see now context. The interesting thing is that we can show that the context size is bounded by the induced width. So we can, uh, it's easy to, uh, to uh, realize that it's uh, bounded by the induced width, so the level of caching will not be more than exponential in the induced width. So we have now from the back door the induced width, exponential in the induced width coming to hunt us, but it's a virtue. Here is another, uh, so here is the general theorem. Uh, the maximum context size of four pseudo three is equal to the three width of the graph along the, the pseudo tree. So here is a more involved example of a graphical model, and this is a pseudo tree, and these are the contexts that are uh, recorded next to each uh, two nodes. So, for example, um, if we look at F, which is deep down here, it has many ancestors: C, H, A, B, and F. And I don't have the back arcs here, so it's hard to, to really illustrate to you why F is only dependent on A and B. Uh, F is, where is F? Ah, F is here. You can see that A and B, once they are instantiated, they separate it from the rest of the problem. So whenever you are solving F, I mean, you, you will cache the results of all the possible values of A and B. And uh, I will show you later on the graph, the enter search graph that is that correspond to this problem. So in, in summary, in intern summary, what I show to you here is four search spaces. We have when we have a graph, we can traverse it in a particular order. The pseudo tree gives us an ordering that capture the fact that certain things can be done in parallel. And there can be several pseudo trees. All you need from a tree that guide the search space to be uh, legitimate is this property that the back arcs, are the arcs that are not on the tree are back arcs. It, but uh, the generalization from DFS tree is that some of these arcs may uh, be arcs that, that do not exist. On the tree, you don't care if there is an arc between A and B or this is an imaginary arc. The, uh, uh, all you care about is that not to have this arc, existing arcs that cut uh, uh, between branches. So once you decide an, uh, on a pseudo tree, the pseudo tree will dictate the search tree. So this is a regular or tree. This is an end or tree along this pseudo tree. But we can further convert them into graphs by this by context, and we can do it also for all trees. So we, instead of searching this tree, we can search this graph without any end decomposition. Here it will be a regular search space, but it's a graph. So we are also having some benefit without having this parallelism. But the most we will get is from this end or tree. And here I, I illustrate the number of nodes in this particular example, but this is the general uh, complexity uh, characterization. Uh, here, uh, if we are uh, in, previously we saw that if we are moving from an or tree to an end or tree, the height captures the complexity and we are still in linear memory. If we are searching the context minimal and or graph, what is the context minimal and or graph? I merge all the nodes based on the context as I defined. And this, uh, we call it minimal and or graph. Obviously, there are additional merging that we cannot recognize that ex exist. If we do that, we are, so in, uh, uh, and we are doing it in the end or graph, we have the time, the graph is now exponential in the tree width. The size of the graph is exponential in the tree width because we, can, we don't need to have uh, more nodes than nodes that are based on the context. So if I have a variable d and its con context is of size uh, 3, the number of times that this level needs to appear in the search tree is only exponential in its context because all the others will be merged. So this argument allows us to conclude that this, the, the size of the 
and or context minimal graph is exponential in the tree width. K is the domain size. So we can traverse it in this time uh, complexity. The memory now is bounded by these two because of the caching that we have to do. I will just tell you up front that actually the memory is far smaller in practice. Many of these caches are called dead caches. Namely, actually, you can reason why you don't have to really remember certain things. But the worst case can be this space. So we are back to time and space in search, exponential in the tree width. This is in the end or case. But if we stay in an or graph, we also have saving. But it's saving, uh, the parameter now is the path width. Path width is similar to the notion of tree width, but uh, it uh, requires that we have, uh, we don't have any tree decomposition, but things are uh, linearly ordered. Uh, and there is a known relationship between the path width and the tree width. Uh, so uh, this, three th this complexity shows how uh, we are benefiting when moving from O3 to end O3 and then to end O graph. And this means that all the queries that we are uh, interested in can be done using search with this uh, compact graph. Um, and here, let me, we have to, sh to stop soon, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is a good place to, to uh, uh, stop, but let me show you this, this example. This is, the endor, uh, this is the graphical model. Here are two pseudo trees for this graphical model. Uh, again, I'm not showing here the back arcs, and you can see the context indicated next to both of them. This one has a high, higher height than this one, but this one has a smaller width. I didn't talk about the width uh, yet. So here is the end or graph associated with this pseudo tree. This is the end or graph associated with this pseudo tree. And the question is which one is better? And there are two parameters that we are interested in, the height and the width. So there is the induced width associated with each one of these ordering, which can be gleaned from the context. The size of the context here is four. Here we have a context of size five, so the height is smaller. The the induced width is higher, and you can ask legitimately what is better and how to get better tree width, how to uh, find a good pseudo width. And uh, in general, there are two algorithms that are popular. They are both approximation algorithms. Mean field algorithm is a known greedy algorithm to order the, uh, the variables. Hypergraph partitioning is another. This one tends to generate small induced width graph but high heights, these ones tend to generate small height but higher uh, uh, induced width. And it depends on whether you are doing caching or not where, where you want to operate. So uh, this is an open question, choose a pseudo tree with minimal search graph, but the uh, uh, that's what we want. Uh, and we can pretty much predict what we will have, except that per determinism is not there. And we don't know how branch and bound when we Traverse it will pull each one of these. But this gives a general uh, idea about these uh, uh, methods. And in addition, I think maybe I'll stop here. If we have constraints, remember I talked about mixed networks, so you have a probabilistic network and some constraints. The constraints prune the search space uh, even more. So I think that's a good place to stop, and we can pick it up. Later. What I plan to do later is to show you how branch and bound work and how you are generating approximation uh, that will guide the heuristic search and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so I promised uh, to talk a little bit about the pseudo width with this slide. I don't know how I skipped it. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned <coughs> that we need a, a tree that guides the end of search space. So, the DFS tree is a natural tree because it has this uh, uh, property inherent that uh, if you generate a spanning tree of a graph, uh, then 
Uh, you will never have arcs of the tree that are not in the arc that are crossing, and this is what ensures, in terms of what the sema this is semantics is necessary for us to have the decomposition, because when we are going in the direction of the tree, we are guaranteed that things will be decomposed when we have a, dec uh, a, a branching in the uh, in the tree. But we don't have to have a DFS tree for this property. Uh, the general uh, tree is called a pseudo tree. This is, for example, a pseudo tree. Uh, it is also, what is a pseudo tree? Is a tree that span, that is defined on all the nodes in the graph, such that any arc uh, on the tree uh, is never crossing. It's, it must be a back arc. But the property that is relaxed is that some of the arcs don't, uh, on the tree don't have to be part of the uh, of the graph. For example, uh, this is the example I tried to recreate and they got confused. Uh, if you have this, if you have this graph, you can see that uh, I can go from one to three and then four and then two. So I have this decomposition and I have this decomposition and this arc from one to three is not in the graph, but it's okay. It's legitimate. So I, uh, if I am doing the, uh, it's still I will have the decomposition that I want. Still I would be able to prove decomposition because I have a, I have a tree, and whenever I am going down, I have decomposition, and I, I don't have an, uh, a, a coursing. Yeah. Okay. That's a very good question. So uh, the way we construct it is uh, by um, for any ordering. Take an arbitrary ordering and generate the induced width, namely connect the parents, and now generate a DFS tree on this induced graph. It will be a pseudo tree. It may be also a, a, uh, a DFS tree. So when we are generating the induced graph, we are adding arcs. So you can see that 1 and 3 and 1 and 5 that are here, actually, what is the ordering here? The ordering is going from the leaves to the root. So I can, uh, I can imagine that this was created the following way. Four, uh, two, three, uh, one, uh, and then six, seven, six, seven, five. Uh, maybe I will put the one here. So that's any any arbitrary ordering will yield uh, a, a legitimate pseudo tree. Not all of them will be good. So what we are recommending is uh, use a, an ordering that uh, y a, a, a will give you a small induced width, like mean fill algorithm. So in this case, if I look at the graph, four is connected to three and uh, to one. A two is connected to one. And two and two three, uh, three is uh, connected to two four. It's already there. Six is connected to one and five, and uh, five uh, seven is connected to one and five, and five is connected to six. Uh, already connected. So if if I'm using this ordering, four is connected to three and to one, so I have to add this arc. But if I'm doing the induced graph construction, namely I'm uh, uh, generating the induced width. Two is connected to three and one, so I have to add the same arc. So I already added it, so I don't need to connect anything else. Three is just connected to one, so no, no parents to connect. Six is connected to five and one, so I'm adding this arc here. Five is connected to five and one, and so I add this arc here. Now, so this is an induced graph. Who the induced width here is two. Every every node has it has no three. Uh, yeah, two. Has at most two earlier neighbors in the induced graph. So if I did variable elimination along this ordering, it would be uh, the uh, exponential in two in terms of the processing of each each bucket. Uh, but now I can now do a DFS tree, so I can start from one. Uh, if I'm going, uh, in, let's do it this way. I start from one, I can go to uh, five because I have an arc, so I can go to five. This is uh, this arc that was added, but it's uh, leg legitimate. From five I can go to seven. 
And from seven, I don't have any arc, so it's a Berg arc, so I have to go back to five. And now I can go to six. You get to six, and I, I don't have uh, anywhere else to go, so I go here, and I go back here. And now I can go to, from one, I can do either to three or two, so I will go to three. This is this arc, three, to three, and then to two. And then I cannot go anymore, so I will go to four here. Is it clear? Yeah. So this is so the, the, the declarative property of what is a pseudo tree I gave you, but you're right. I mean, when I'm saying DFS tree, it's clear how you create it because you are doing DFS traversal. If I'm defining it that way, it's not clear how to generate it. So the, this is a procedure. These arcs that are not in the tree are actually often induced arc. They are arcs that will be created if I did variable elimination from leaves to root. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's how it is. And uh, Yeah. Yes. All the edges that are all the edges. That it, you, yeah. When you put all the edges on the tree, none of them cross. Right. That's that's the property, and it's more general. And be, and the point is that uh, because it's more general, it can lead to better uh, structures because the height. You can see that the height of the of the DFS tree is four. The height of the pseudo tree is just three. So the, it, potentially, it can lead to better. Trees uh, and this proper and and the, indeed the height that affected the height here it's written m is bounded by double star log n uh, requires that we will consider also this pseudo tree. So uh, for this particular example, if I if I had done the end or tree along the DFS tree, I will get this tree here. If I'm doing it along the pseudo tree, I'm getting a uh, a tree that is shallower. Sometimes you will have a higher branching degree, so I mean it's not immediately easy to say that only the high determined the number of nodes that you have to traverse. But overall, you are getting uh, a, a, the, the collection of legitimate trees that guide and or decomposition is larger. And the minimum one you would want now, if we define the optimization task that we are uh, after, is we want to find a pseudo tree with a minimal height. But so that we know, it's known that DF to find that the minimum height of the DFS tree is also hard, and the pseudo, uh, and the height of the pseudo width is also hard. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, nowadays uh, theorems about parametric complexities. Normally, that they will, they will include these parameters uh, in the parametric analysis, and things will become tractable. Uh, but uh, to find the minimal uh, ones, it's uh, in it's hard in general. Questions? Okay. So I'm going to move now and show uh, how. Uh, so we, uh, what I define is a, a, the, the notion of general search space that is compact, and we can answer any query on it better, uh, given that we have the memory if we are do, if we are using uh, the gra the graph. But let's see a look now at optimization, and in optimization we want to find an optimal solution, and uh, uh, we can use all the literature about heuristic search doing the uh, depth first branch and bound, or best first search, and we know very well how to do these things on uh, uh, general search trees. Uh, and we know that uh, best first search is normally better, in general, will expand less node, nodes than branch and bound, but it has the memory problem and so on. And in the context of graphical models, uh, more so than in the context of pathfinding problems or planning, uh, people are, tend to do only mostly depth first branch and bound because you know that the, 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 the length of a solution, you don't have all these problems that you face in planning that the solution may be very long and you don't know uh, a bound on it in advance. So uh, most of the virtues of best first search are not that great or not pay off uh, in the context of graphical models when the number of variables is bounded. And this is normally the method of choice Although recently we are looking also at best first search for a variety of reasons. So a picture of depth sphere branch and bound is here. 
if we are using heuristic, I mean, we want a path. We have a G that captured the length of the path that we discover up to a node N. And we have a heuristic evaluation function that is an underestimate if we are doing minimization. Uh, and uh, we have the current search that we passed give us, giving us an upper bound on the best solution so far. And if uh, the, the, F, the evaluation function is the G plus the H, and we prune if the evaluation function is greater than upper bound because we know that there is no potential of better solution than what we found so far. So this is the classical branch and bound. And now we just need to do it on the end of search space. And all this is available I mean, the literature when, when we looked at it is uh, ready for this type of algorithms. It's well known. And all search spaces are well known in the heuristic search literature already defined by Nielsen and how to do uh, to explore it by best first search or depth first search with heuristics. We simply applied it to this particular uh, graphical model scenario. So basically what in, in, in general search you have a path that you extend. Here if this is a pseudo tree that guides our search space. When you know the pseudo tree, you have an image of the whole search space. Then you have a partial solution tree when you are when you are doing searching. So you, let's say that you uh, you expand A, you have zero, and now you expand uh, this end node and two nodes below it, and you expand this. So this is a partial solution tree, and you need to continue. The continuation of a partial solution tree it's a little bit more complex than a path because there are, you can ex uh, extend it in various ways. You can extend B to zero. You can extend D by zero. You have different extensions, uh, dif different potential extensions uh, uh, here described. And these are, all these are the, ex the possible, ex possible extension of this initial solution tree. And we need to really decide we, which one to choose when we are doing the end or search in a depth first search manner. Uh, so we can enumerate them. And we need to define when we want to evaluate the different potential extension when we are doing the search, we need to be able to, to, uh, uh, to evaluate their evaluation function. So the evaluation function is uh, defined uh, in the way that you will compute the cost of a partial tree. So here is a partial. Uh, this is an, another example to illustrate this. We have this primal graph. And here we have three functions. Each one is defined on three variables. And we are searching. Uh, and this is the pseudo tree that we are using. So A is either 0 or 1. B is, uh, a, we already expanded to 0 and 1. We already expanded fully this portion of the tree. And we already know that the cost, the minimal cost below here is 9. This is evaluating this tree, it's 9. Uh, so we also know that uh, there is an upper bound on the, uh, the total cost of 9. Uh, this value is a, an upper bound um, a, on the cost. Now we are here. We, we, we try the, a different. We already explored. We are trying B equal 1. And the, it has three child nodes. And uh, uh, we, uh, this is a small one. And we, we now need to evaluate it. So if we knew the exact minimal cost below this, we can just plug it in, the, the value, the best solution below V, the best solution below D and Z. And this would give us the exact evaluation function, namely. So it will give us what is the best way to extend this tree uh, and what will be the minimum value. Of, of course, we don't have it, but we need to know this concept, the, the concept of exact evaluation function, the exact extension of this partial tree. So the cost is composed of, this is sort of the G, the cost of the weights on the partial tree that I am examining. So the A, A equal the weight on, A, A, on this arc plus the weight on this arc plus the weight on C equals 0, C the, uh, the zero is here plus the weight on d equals zero. It's here. Um, d equals zero. Why we don't have this? I don't remember. Uh, and and then and then we have uh, the uh, going here. We we replace the the. Uh, this would be the heuristic evaluation function, but this is a, the exact values. But we don't have them. If we don't have them, we replace them with heuristic functions. 
So it will be the same, but here I have heuristic value, and here I have heuristic value. And I will plug it in here, and this will be my estimate of this extension. And if it, and it, all, it is always underestimated, because the heuristic is, is an underestimate of the value below that node. Am I making myself clear? So in the, in the regular search, the heuristic is an estimate of the, the shortest path to the goal. In uh, end of search, the heuristic is an estimate of the value below the node. And the value is the minimum cost of the tree below it. So this is what we uh, need. Once we understand how to combine, how to evaluate the, the partial solution tree, if we have the exact extension, we are just replacing them with the heuristic function, and it will be a lower bound. So in this particular ca case, it will be 12. I'm confused whether we are doing a, a, a maximization or minimization. No, it's a lower bound, so we are doing minimization. 12 is higher. The lower bound that we have is higher than the upper bound. The upper bound is 9. So we are going to prune. We are not going to uh, uh, continue below, uh, to explore below uh, these nodes. Is it clear? Uh, the, in principle, it's the same. It's a little bit more involved when you are exploring the end of search graph because there are many leaves. You have, you have choices of extension in more than one case. And uh, the evaluation is somewhat more complex because there is end or a combination. But in principle, it's, it's not really uh, far more complex. So uh, uh, overall, uh, this is a picture that shows how the, the, the search. So we have, an, in this case, we have an upper bound here of 5. We already explore, that comes from exploring this subtree. This is uh, a, another example. We are exploring this portion. We want to extend the tree. If, if the evaluation function that we have here is uh, larger than the upper bound, we will pull. That's it. So all the, all the algorithm can be extended. So we, uh, in general, for branch and bound, uh, we associate each node n with a heuristic lower bound on the value of the node. And we expand. Uh, we ex evaluate the uh, a, a value of the current extension. And we pawn. And otherwise, we ex uh, expand the tip one of, if it's not pawned, if this condition is not if, if this condition, namely, if the evaluation function is uh, larger than the upper bound, we expand n and we continue. To evaluate, we have this bottom-up uh, process that we need to really do to evaluate the value of a tree. Uh, we abde update the value of a parent pn uh, by minimization for all nodes and summation for n nodes. And that's the, uh, the general scheme. And the best first search can be done in the same way. Best first search is more difficult to implement because imagine in, in regular search, we, in the best first search, we are keeping a frontier of open nodes, all these nodes in open. When we are doing it on end or you may think, oh, now we have to keep a frontier of partial solution trees. It's enormous. But it's possible to do it effectively and, and, and uh, in a way that you don't have. You're actually keeping a frontier of node and you can, by, ma by appropriate marking, you, you know, you can know which is the next best, best partial solution tree to evaluate. So uh, the general mechanism you expand, uh, so in general, best of is just a property. It's better than best of search, but it requires to throw all the subtrees. Uh requires to store all the subtrees. Um, here is just repeating the properties that I already said, uh, that uh, comparing best first to depth first search. Uh, if we do it for the best first for end or search, we have to maintain a set of best partial solution trees. Uh, but it, uh, we do the top-down step, expanding. We trace down marked connectors from root, so that we, we currently have the mark connectors that will lead us to the best partial solution tree now. This was done in, uh, earlier. And then we expand tip node n by generating its successors, all its successor. We associate each successor with a heuristic evaluation function. And its first uh, 
uh, and this, the value below this node is initialized to the heuristic evaluation function, and later on, when we evaluate below it, it will be updated to get uh, a more accurate uh, information. This is when we go down. Once we expand a node, we have to revise the whole structure that we keep in order, we have to update. Uh, the values of all the nodes, and we do this by minimization and summation. And uh, after we did the propagation, we mark the most promising solution tree from the root. And we also label some node is solve, and all node is solve if, if, if uh, it's child node is solve. So we want to know when, when we completely evaluated a particular subtree, and then n node is solve if the, all the children are solved. And we terminate when we, if, when we mark the root node solved. And this is exactly how it is done in Nielsen's original paper. It just we are doing it for this particular case. Um, and all the properties uh, I mentioned earlier are uh, a, uh, applicable in terms of memory and time. The problem, so we are now searching the context minimal and or graph. So bunch and bound will also have caching because we want to exploit the graph. The graph structure is uh, bounded exponentially by the tree width. Best first search explores the same graph, which is also bound exponentially by the tree width. You may think, and I did think that, that now uh, branch and bound and best first search are on the same footing. I mean, best for search, we need memory, but so would branch and bound, and sh they should sort of be the same. And uh, this, uh, this work was uh, done by my student, Rad Radu Marinesco, uh, and he explored all this. And at the time, we were surprised, at least I was surprised, how come best for search is far worse memory-wise than still branch and bound when we, they explore the graph. Uh, and uh, but best first search is better in time whenever memory is manageable for it. I, I didn't really realize why why this is the case when both of them are exploring this graph and the uh, depth first search really needs to co to cache all these results. Uh, Radu, who implemented everything, said yes, but you have to keep all this frontier and the uh, branch and bound doesn't need to do that. And this is true. So one, one of the things that we realize, especially now, is that the level of memory that you really need for depth first branch and bound uh, when the tree width is manageable, namely, when the tree width is huge, there is no graph. This is something to really think about. Assume that everything is connected. If everything is connected, the context of every node is everything before it. So it's a tree anyway. You don't have a graph. So when the tree width is bounded, then you exploit. Then you have a graph that is minimum, mi uh, uh, meaningful. Uh, so this is one point. Another point, there are many, many um, uh, merging, many uh, variables that you will not, that are also tree-like, namely you don't need to merge on. So when, when you look at the graph, you can realize that on many variables you don't need to cache at all. This is applicable to branch and bound. The best for search must cache all the frontier. So there is still... It cannot. So be, you, if you combine best first with depth first, you can. If you have an upper bound, if no, yeah, if, you if, bound. if you have a bound, you can pull. So there are certain things that you can I do. No, but you, risk it, you know that best first search is stop. When it stop, it's the optimal solution. So right. there is no pruning. In, in, in pure best first search, there is no pruning. Best first search just go uh, with the F value and uh, uh, increasing F value, increasing F value, and it stop. It, it's true if you knew what is the optimal solution, or if you get it from other source, you could so throw. You upper bound. If you had some upper bound, you could not uh, keep those nodes in open. Uh, but so you could do that, uh, and it could definitely help. But uh, still, 
even if it's not, but still you will have many, many more nodes. So uh, this is uh, one of the empirical observations. The fact that you need to keep the frontier is problematic. Uh, we had recently experienced uh, an additional experience with that because we recently investigated weighted best first search algorithm. When the heuristic function is multiplied by a weight, in order to use best for search to make uh, any time algorithms. And we have the memory issues. So uh, it's, it's good, but uh, often we will have memory problems, and it's not that is easy to, to do better than depth first batch and bound because of this. But uh, it's still a very good candidate that sh we should consider. It's not difficult to get upper bound. You get stochastic local search. You can do, uh, and we, uh, everyone is doing it. Uh, some algorithms that will get you some good al uh, solution, and stochastic local search often get, give you uh, the, the optimal solution. Yes. Yeah. So you don't know that, but yeah. So uh, uh, it, this is why it's very helpful for depths first branch and bound, because the, the uh, problem with depths first search is that you may explore nodes whose evaluation function is greater than the optimal solution. But if you have initially the optimal solution, you can overcome that. And this is why it's very hard for best first search to compete in the context of graphical model, to compete with the with depth first search. And most people don't consider it. Uh, we started to consider it in recent years. And it and, um, like you said, if I have a, an upper bound, I can improve best first search in my yeah, but uh, so if you had an upper bound, it can help both algorithms. Yeah. For best first search, it can pull, it can help with the memory. Yeah. yeah. For depth first search, it can help with the fact that it might explore nodes whose evaluation function is greater than uh, larger than the optimal solution. Uh, so, uh, but depth first search is good memory wise to begin with. So, uh, yeah, but so you can do both. And uh, uh, you can use both. But it's harder still. It's uh, the, uh, the memory issues. You will get into memory, sh memory issue with best first search. We do not get into memory issues with depth first search. Uh, and, it's, and I was surprised because even when the tree width is very big, but when the tree width is very big, things are trees and not graphs. Yeah. So it's uh, involved. And so, I mean, w when we uh, think about this trade-off, we say, well, and or branch bound is any time and best first is not, but you can ma do many things to exploit both. So this is up to now. I mean, I didn't t tell you exactly how to use a heuristic evaluation function because I am now going to move to approximation, to methods that uh, generates bounds on the optimal solutions. And then I will talk about how you use those uh, methods uh, in, uh, in search. So uh, uh, these methods, uh, I will talk about two types of methods and their combination and how to combine them into uh, heuristic search. And the first one is the mini bucket scheme. And this method is very simple and it goes back, remember again now, the variable elimination algorithm, bucket elimination algorithm. In that algorithm, there is, uh, we process bucket by bucket and in each bucket we have functions. Some of them are the original functions. Some of them functions that uh, was, were replaced there by processing previous functions. What we need to do is this. This is the operation. We sum all of them, and we marginalize over the variable x. And this creates a function. This function may be on too many variables, and it may be uh, more than our memory can allow. If the induced width is high, it's not possible to do. So a, a brute force idea is just to partition it to two mini buckets and just to apply the same uh, processing to each mini bucket and then combine. Namely, instead of computing this function, we will compute a function over this subset of variables, a function over this subset of variables, and then merge and get some approximation. If you look carefully, you can see that this process generate a lower bound. So we wanted to compute h. And by doing that, we are computing another function. And it's possible to really show easily that it's a low, we are uh, computing something that is smaller than the original, a value by value. Because we are sort of 
putting the minimization inside the summation, we allowed ourselves to uh, put mi minimization over x uh, inside, and it's possible to realize that. Okay, so that's good. We can now apply the Beckett elimination algorithm, and whenever we have too many functions, we will partition. So if we, this is our example, and this is our ordering, we have three functions here. Let's, it's too much. Let's say we cannot process it that way. We will partition somehow. And instead of generating one function, we are generating two functions. This is one. We put it in the bucket of E because it's only on E. This one is a function on A and D. We remove B. Uh, we put it here. And we can continue. Uh, and we can use a parameter, an I bound, that will tell us how many functions we are willing to process at once. And if the I bound is, is, uh, is too uh, we don't need, we will not need to partition anymore. And when we are get, got, getting down, we only partition the, the top bucket, we are getting a lower bound on the optimal solution. So the, the, this, this thing that we did can be, can be given a meaning. What we are doing is actually, when we are doing, is we are duplicating a variable. So if we have variable u, let's say it's connected and uh, related to all these variables. If we posit it completely, we have to record the function or all its neighbors. Instead, we are duplicating it into two variables, u and u prime, uh, for each mini bucket, and we are processing it separately. So this idea can be uh, uh, given a semantic, and once we are duplicating the variable, we are doing bucket elimination, and that would give us the approximation. This is a useful uh, a understanding of what we are doing there. Uh, so uh, here is again our example. We can think about this bucket elimination as if we are processing this graph where b and b is duplicated. It's b here and it's b prime here, and that's the graph actually that we are processing. So B here is connected to, and did I do it right? B here is connected to A and C. It should be actually a B. There is a B that connected to D and E. Actually, I should call it, this is the, uh, I should replace the names. This is B prime and this is B. Uh, if I want to be consistent with the drawing. There is one B that is connected to D and E for this mini bucket, and one B that connected to A and C. So some of the functions will be with the B, some will be the before uh, you mean process yeah. before yeah, then yeah. It would be apparent of both of the bees. yes yes you will have to really uh, yeah yeah so we it's possible now having this understanding to start and do the du variable duplication on the graph and then to process it um, and uh, and consider any method uh, that uh, will uh, that will give us a uh, that we exploit the sparser graph, and any exact computation will give us lower bound. This is a very uh, a, a simple way of doing it mechanically. Uh, so yeah. This is a, so the computation with the mini bucket is a precise computation for this graph? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're guaranteed in some way that the, the frequency is the same? Yes. So the, I, the I bound that we are choosing, so you are forcing, we say, we want not more than. Uh, three. Uh, we are doing the partitioning so that in each mini bucket you will have at most three, okay. and then we are guaranteed that uh, what we are uh, uh, generating. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So here is a, a, this is just side by side. Uh, this is another graph. So the, uh, the essential thing is you have a parameter that you control. And you say maximum number of variable allowed in a mini bucket. Initially, we also have the number of functions. Uh, but it, it turned out to be not a very flexible parameter to use. We abandoned that. But it could be relevant at some point. Uh, the output is a lower bound. Suboptimal, but also an upper bound. Why? So if this is our problem, this is what would happen, and this would be the three width if we process it regularly. This is what happens when we enforce the I bound of two, so the in induced width is two. And the, um, th so here the parameter is three, namely how many variables you are allowed in a mini bucket. Um, uh, ah, I didn't say here how, how we are getting the upper bound. 
the upper bound we are getting by, uh, how did we get a solution when we solve it exactly? By assigning values to the variable and we are getting a solution, right? But it, and we are guaranteed it will be optimal when we run the exact algorithm. But if we don't, we can just go and use the function that we have as advice, as if pretend that we have the exact algorithm and generate a solution. Once we generate a solution, its cost is easy to compute. And this is an upper bound because it's not minimal necessarily. So we are getting, with this scheme, we are getting a lower bound in the past going down. And by generating a solution that is advised by the function that we have, we are getting an upper bound. And we can examine the upper bound and the lower bound and see how good we are doing. So this was uh, initially what the way we looked at it. Uh, so the complexity of the mini bucket algorithm is exponential in the I bound that we selected. We have here the number of functions, which is all also play a part. And uh, the space, this is important, is exponential in the I bound. And it leans a, a upper bound and a lower bound. And the accuracy determined by, we can determine by the ratio of upper to lower. And we know that as I increase, both accuracy and complexity increase. And now we can use it. We can use it in an anytime algorithm, namely increase the I bound until we get a, a good ratio. Or what we exploit more is we can use it in search. So just a few more uh, slides about the first approach. So we can have a, a, an algorithm that has a parameter epsilon that says, well, the accuracy that I want is epsilon. And I can run it uh, starting with some initial I bound. And in some step, I can generate the upper bound and lower bound and uh, examine whether the ratio of upper lo lo and lower bound is within this epsilon and stop when it is. We experimented with it. This was work with uh, my student, Irina Rich, a long time ago. And uh, it, actually, it was even before that this is our journal paper. No, actually, our journal paper is 2003. So it's actually the right date. Um, and uh, we experimented a little bit on this. And uh, here is just a flavor of things that we observed. At that time, we had the CPCS networks that has uh, they were perceived to be quite difficult. Uh, they're uh, coming from the medical diagnosis, either 30, 360 nodes or 422 nodes. And we tried the anytime idea. So we, the, we, as a function of the I bound, here you have I equal 1, 10, 100. I'm not sure. No, there are two. On the, on the x-axis, you have I bound and you have time. Uh, so the, the upper curve corresponds to CPCS 422. You can see that this is the ratio between the upper bound and lower bound. You can see that initially when the I bound was small, uh, we had very bad accuracy I mean, with the I bound, but there, at some point the accuracy increased very much and then it, it decreased and we got a, a within the epsilon. The other network was easier, so we start uh, with better accuracy even when the I bound is smaller until we converge and we can stop at some point. So what we observed at that time is when we ran the algorithm to completion, this was where the times, but when we ran them with this anytime idea with very small epsilon, we got very accurate results far earlier. Uh, so it, it just showed that this is possible and uh, it's, a, it's a, an approach to consider. We didn't pursue that very much because the idea of using it uh, as a heuristics was far more appealing. And before I will move to that, I uh, would like to talk about another approach to uh, approximation, an orthogonal approach, and then how we combine it. Yes. No, I like it. Go ahead. So, I mean, I don't know what more general. So, the, uh, you, yeah, the notion of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, manipulating the graph, it's interesting because uh, when we are conditioning, when we are assigning values to a variable, we also manipulate the graph. We are actually, it's as if we are taking the nodes from the graph and splitting it. When we are duplicating, we are making it sparse in a different way. And indeed, 
here we are, when we are conditioning, we are not approximating. It's give condition on the uh, current values. This is what you have. So these are the, if you remember my first figure about the graph, what happened with the graph, conditioning will split the problem into several ones. Here we are not splitting the problem into several problems. We are just relaxing the problem. And uh, we did not explore uh, ideas of actually graph and, and no duplication. Uh, what we are doing, in fact, is doing it together with the computation. Uh, and I, I think uh, there is a, a room for a lot of, uh, of uh, exploration of these ideas. We, we did not explore it uh, more. But I think the semantics is very pleasing because you understand, you understand what is going on. What is it that you are doing? Yeah, it's very simple. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's good to understand what is it that you relax. And actually, the methods that I will talk about now are not that different. So there is a relationship between anything. So I don't know if you hear about uh, many of these ideas has relationship to the notion of arc consistency, consistency in constrained algorithm. To me, the idea of mini bucket came from there. So there is the notion of arc consistency, path consistency, I consistency. When you solve constraint problem, and this in, in a nutshell, it's as if you are looking what we are doing. We, you have a big problem, and you say, let's look only at small, small, small sub-problems and just process them to completion, but small problem on, on subset of variables. So the I consistency is how many variables you are focusing on when you are doing this consistency. Uh, there is this notion of directional I consistency that, to me, brought the mini bucket. Uh, because constraints are very restrictive and have properties the general cost function do not have, you cannot do it in an arbitrary way. You cannot just uh, do it uh, in all places of the graph. You must really be careful, and this is why we can do it nicely uh, in an ordered manner. But it comes from there. There is another idea that comes from uh, our consistency that is called uh, in the constraint community soft R consistency. And this is the desire there is how much we can uh, push the ideas of relaxation by our consistency to cost function. But when you have cost function, shifting cost is more tricky. Uh, the, the schemes that I'm going to talk about now fall in this class, and many communities arrived to this idea from different directions. So the constraint community will call these ideas a, a soft R consistency. And the idea is to shift. You have functions. You want to do something, let's shift cost. Let's move cost from one function to another, such that we're then when you are doing this local uh, operation, it will be better than doing it on the original function. That's the idea. Uh, the community of uh, uh, linear uh, relaxation or dual decomposition, uh, it comes from conv convex optimization, and they are using it. Uh, from, uh, using ideas that come from that community. So let me try to explain what the, the nutshell is. So suppose I have this graph. And you see E12 it's also already stands for energy. So uh, this is, uh, uh, the, I'm working with Alex Eiler that comes from the uh, NIPS community. And uh, he, uh, that's uh, the slides actually that uh, he uses. And uh, often we talk, they talk about Markov network and energy function and things like that. But it's the same thing. So E12 is just the function between these two variables. And if we have this, this simple example and we want to, do, to do what we are doing, to maximize or minimize this sum, let's duplicate. Remember duplication? And they, uh, the dual decomposition is an extreme duplication. You say. Each function, it's on mini bucket. They don't say that. But each function is a separate mini bucket. It means that actually I'm duplicating x1 with x1 prime. Each two variables here are duplicated. And now instead of maximizing the sum, I will sum the maximized function. This is if I do it brute force. But you don't want to do it brute force. You, want, you realize, actually, that we can decompose. But now let's put constraints, this red line, that say that x1 must be equal to x1 prime, x2 equal to x2 prime. Each one of these must be equal. And try to do this, but we try to really enforce to, to the extent that we can the, 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 these constraints. 
How do they enforce it? They use, use Lagrangian, Lagrangian relaxation uh, multiplier and things like that. But we can think about it as follows. We will have, uh, we will shift cost between these functions uh, in a way that the, the total cost will not change. So for each variable and for each of its neighbors, we, we define functions. This is on uh, the functions. And the, the sum of these functions for each i and j is 0. So we are not changing anything because we are, uh, the objective, the general objective function is the same. But now we, for each function, for each function we, we shift, we, uh, we add to it uh, from each of its neighbor. You can think, uh, if you think about this function x1, x2, we, we the lambda, I, lambda x1 uh, sends something from this function here and we, you get for something from this function here. And this change this function. Likewise, you will, set, you will have some, uh, some cost that is sent from this function here and from this function here. So this one will change. So each function is changed by some cost shifts. The total cost is the same. But now, instead of minimizing this original function, we are minimizing a, a parameterized set of function, a new set of function. And we are, we are maximizing. But we can try that this shift will be the best. We can try, this gives us an upper bound. Let's have this upper bound the tightest. So we replace, let me, let me show you again. We had brute force, this is the uh, idea. But let's change those functions somehow so that this bound will be tightest. We are saying we are doing it by this cost, this uh, new function that we define. And we want to find those functions that will make this bound, upper bound, tightest. So what we gain, if we, let's assume that we find those functions, we gain uh, a, a, an approximation to our bound that is much better than this one, the brute force one. So if you, if you uh, maintain the constraint that x1 is equal to x1 prime, then you get an exact solution. Yes, so we are not doing that. Right. But we, this is the intuition. Right. Yeah. So, so how do you come up with this function? OK, so that's the, that's a, that's the next question. But, then, but, now, but now we are just saying what we want to do. So what we want to do is uh, to find functions that will make the approximation, that will make maximization on each function separately much better than the original one. How we find these functions? So there are various methods. And uh, from uh, the literature of uh, uh, linear uh, convex optimization, this is called the uh, Lagrangian multiplier. And they, we know how to solve this problem optimally. So now the max is on these three terms. Ma the maximum is on this. Okay. For each, for each, for each uh, pair of vari variables, you, uh, you, for each pair of variables separately, yes. you are maximizing this, this whole term. But, and we want to find those lambdas okay. that will give us the tightest bound. And this is also called, this is why it's called reparameterization often, because you are actually changing the function. Reparameterize, they call the function parameters, and the, this is reparameterization. It's also called cost shifting, because you are shifting costs from one to another. And it's also called soft R consistency. So uh, we decompose the graph into smaller subproblems, solve each uh, independently, exact if all co it will be exact if all copies agree. And we enforce uh, the lost equ equality constraints via Lagrange multiplier. Uh, now, this leads, and I will talk a little bit more about it, but this is uh, in the literature. You have, it's called, the, this operation It's called dual decomposition. There are known algorithms that appear. Global Zone, uh, for instance, in uh, Hebrew University, he uh, was one of the authors about uh, this is uh, MPLP method. TRW, if you are familiar, and uh, uh, for a while it was not known that the whole the whole line of literature in constraints uh, that is uh, uh, directed in, in this way, they came up with heuristic ideas of how to shift costs and also with the optimal uh, formulation of the problem. So how? So now that we know what we want, how do we get there? Uh, uh, the first method, I mean, the, the, uh, the first idea is to just use um, uh, uh, all sorts of methods um, coming from uh, the, this uh, culture, like subgradient methods and, and message passing methods, in order to solve the problem that we said. And one of the algorithms is Fartograph linear programming. This is our version of MPLP. It's just 
to do this iterative algorithm, if you look at what this uh, the subgradient method is, it gives you, and I will illustrate, a message passing method where you are, uh, for each variable and for each of uh, the functions that it, co it is connected to, you are, uh, the function sends some, some uh, messages to the variable and the variable sends some functions to the uh, information messages to the function. This iterates until convergence and is guaranteed to be optimal. A JGLP is in the, the, and, and MBMM are ideas of how to combine the mini bucket with this idea. So we have these ideas of the mini, we are uh, uh, doing something si similar, but our functions are bigger, not just a, sing a single function, but we take many functions and we uh, and into a cluster and we are operating uh, in a, a, a higher uh, level of accuracy. So JGLP is the idea of just doing that. You can just first cluster functions into clusters, and then treat each cluster as a function, and then pass messages between the clusters. This is the joint graph linear programming, and I will elaborate soon. And there is another version that we uh, came up with that uh, say, well, let's do the, min the the bucket elimination and only shift cost within bucket separately and have one cost. So let me go through these three ideas and in somewhat more detail. So factor graph linear programming, I already said almost everything. It's just that uh, we want to tighten uh, factors over xi simultaneously. So we are um, one of them that says, well, let's compute the max marginal. So I have here a function. I will maximize over all the variables but xi, and I will generate a function over xi for each function. So for each function, I'm just maximizing it separately, and I'm sending this information to xi. And now I update the function. This is how I update. For each function, I'm taking uh, away, removing the, the amount of cost it, it sends to xi, and it gets back uh, a combination of all the uh, uh, max marginal uh, average coming from the neighbors. This this formula it just can be generated for any of you. Get all this method it can be proved, but there are other variants. So there, there are many variants that you can come up with that will uh, that uh, I will give you uh, an alg iterative algorithm that is optimal, and uh, uh, some of them converge faster than others, and uh, we normally don't run anything to convergence, practically, but uh, uh, this is the variant that we use uh, that uh, looks quite effective uh, for the, the case when you shift a cost between functions. Here is how, how uh, and now is the, the other method, uh, embedding it in the, in the mini bucket, here is the function that you have in the mini bucket. We say this will be one mini bucket and this is another. The mini bucket also uh, suggests some kind of a joint graph, what is known as a joint graph, clustering uh, of nodes. You can just look at the structure of message passing, which will be this tree, and also connect uh, the uh, mini buckets in a bucket to one another. And what you create is a, is a joint graph. It's a structure. A, a, the graph decomposition of the, of the functions that has desirable properties. In particular, you know that the, the number of variables in each cluster is your i bar. And this can be used for generalized mean population for those of you who know. But in particular, we can now do this iterative algorithm on this structure and until converges. The idea beyond FGLP is that it's more accurate because we are doing exact computation within cluster and it doesn't operate on single functions. So the I is controlling the complexity of now and the accuracy of this message. So this is the second version that combines the back and with ideas with uh, cost shifting. The third one is the, sim the simplest one which says, well, we want an effective algorithm just to improve the mini bucket. So before, we, when we are partitioning uh, the uh, bucket into two mini buckets, let's do cost shifting between them, and that's it. And now we could, uh, once we did the cost shifting, 
uh, in a simple way, we are uh, generating the functions and we are continuing its one iteration. We call it Billy Bucket with moment matching. The moment matching, another name, another term comes from uh, this literature, and this algorithm would be uh, more fast. But it has one iteration, it will be better in general than the mini bucket because you have the same bucket cost shift. So, uh, I, I, I have to hear. Okay. Uh, when you uh, do this cost shifting here, you basically uh, add something to the left one, reduce something from the right one, yeah. and then you have new functions, yes. right? So you have a FP of E given BC, say minus M12, and yes. uh, the other plus and whatever. Yes. Okay, and then and that's in your new function. Yeah. And how do you how do you know what to add? In Okay, so you are the, the same principles that we are developed in the case of iteration, we are, we are doing it locally within. So uh, we, are, we do the same algorithm as if this is my, uh, my whole problem. So the, how I do that, again, the, 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 uh, the optimization, that there, are, there is an intuition. One, one intuition is that if, if, when would this be exact, if the maximum of B that we will get at the end here will be equal to the maximum of B that we get, and this will be exact. So, actually, what is it? what we want to shift costs in order to encourage this equality, and uh, so we are. Uh, if you take, if you take, uh, uh, you marginalize, you take uh, the maximum of all this, uh, the rest of the variable, you get a function on B here, from here. You are maximizing over E and C as if you don't have anything else and you get a function over B from here and you say that this must be equal. This leads to some cost. This is the ad hoc explanation of what we can do. I don't have it here, I have it uh, in some other slide. Um, so you, you, you compute the maximum of B given the other variables here and here and you try to somehow... Uh, I, I will compute, this is a function on B, A and B. I will maximize D and A out right. and I will get something on B from right. here. Okay. Here I will do the same and I will force equality. And this okay, so will be similar various values of B should have the same maximum? Yes. Also, something like that. Okay. This is an intuition but it also can be derived so uh, from equations, so this is another, this is actually the max marginal. You can see here, we are for each function, we are computing the maximum of all the variables that are not xi. Mm -hmm. We are generating a function that uh, we will send from here to here, the same, and uh, here, and then these things, these uh, uh, max marginals are summed and normalized by the number of functions, I think, uh, and uh, that's how this is the same intuition. I think that the notion from soft R conductivity is like that you think that uh, you must have certain if certain cost is included in all edges which are connected with XI, then you need to include it in XI. I think this is yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, you can you can look at it. Uh, so these are all different ways of uh, yeah. making constraints soft. The constraint that the value should be equal soft by. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then you can do it optimally. Even if your problem is like algorithm, you can you can phrase it as linear optimization. Actually, and you see this. It's possible too. But it would not be the best way necessarily. So they there should not be an iterative method. But uh, the iterative methods apparently proceed to be best, and you can also solve before getting the optimal solution. Okay. So these are the three ideas that we explored. Let me show you some empirical uh, illustration of what we got. So uh, we have a bunch of uh, benchmarks. We have pedigrees, grades, large families coming from the constraint community, the probabilistic community. In this case, we have this number of instances, and this is just statistic to illustrate the size of the problem. The number of variables are between 500 and 1,000, the domain size, the range, <coughs> and the induced width where it lies, and the height of the pseudo width, because that's what we use. So first, it's just the optimization task without search. We don't have search yet. Uh, and this is just to illustrate how the, the strength of this 
a soft out consistency of reparameterization scheme on top of mini bucket. So here is time. This is low probability, and uh, lower is better. And uh, you can see that the mini bucket, as a function of time, is getting better until it is uh, clever. Levels are actually confused. So we have here two methods, MB and MB and M, which are not iterative. So they correspond to the two straight line. They, they don't change with time. The, uh, the method that the change with time are FGLP, the one that operates on the original functions, and the JGLP that operates on clusters. So you can see that the one that operates on the original function initially is very bad, but it's getting better with iteration until it converges. It doesn't get to the optimal solution. The uh, MBEMM is quite good and it's very fast. This is MBE, mini bucket elimination. The JGLP takes time because of the cluster and iteration, so initially it's not, you it's don't not even, time. You, it's not, it's any time from a, a particular point on. Yeah, yeah. But then it, it, it does, it has a big overhead, but it's the best eventually. Uh, and this is the theoretically, uh, you, and you can see it over all the instances. So definitely we see that this really pushes the, the, the bounding scheme significantly, and then especially the MBE-MM is quite appealing because it's much better than MBE and it's very fast. So the next thing is how to do it in your I how to use this bounding scheme within heuristic search. Uh, so I told you how to do this a bunch of bound and we speak heuristics here and there, but let's make the connection. Converting the bounds into um, heuristic. So all these things we want to Connect, and I will give you the flavor of the idea. Sometimes it is hard to see. So here is I have this graph, and I want to do search. So now the search is uh, you have to switch uh, it to starting from left to right. This is the search tree. So we uh, assign a some value. Uh, we assign e uh, the value zero and one, and let's say we are at this point with variable d. This is the full search. So what they, in general we want is the heuristic, the heuristic evaluation function is for the constant value of A and E, we want to evaluate D for its two values. So we have a G and we have an H and we have somehow wants to really see where the heuristic function will come from. The heuristic function comes from the mini bucket elimination in the following way. We ran first. On the, on the ordering that is consistent with this search that we rest the mini bucket evaluation, and it generated all these functions. And we have a partitioning only in one place. So what is these functions? These functions are low bound on the cost to go. So when we want to compute the value, the heuristic function uh, at this point, we know we have some information that we know. We know the cost to go from A to uh, A uh, equals zero, and E equals zero. It's uh, this value. Uh, is the value of F, the original function at a particular point. And now we want to compute the, the H. The H at D is simply uh, the, the functions that are generated in, uh, were generated in bucket in earlier bucket and reside. In B or in earlier buckets, if they were created here. So only these two functions, the sum of these two functions will be the evaluation function, the cost to go uh, at this point. So this is our heuristic evaluation function. I'm not sure I explained it very clearly. Let me recap. The idea of mini bucket is that because we partition at each point, we are getting lower bound on the cost to go. Because the executive function is the exact cost. If we are partitioning, we are getting a lower bound on the cost. So we just need to figure out where, and this is the functions that we record. So we just need to really have an understanding when this, this, this function are sort of tables. We are running this before we start search. We get these functions. And we just, when we go to a particular assignment condition of values, let's say a equals 0 and e equal 1, we need to figure out what is the lower bound of the best cost to go that is dictated by the function we record. The rule is, we can figure out what is the rule. The rule is look at the functions that were created in the buckets above and reside either in D or below D. I am not looking at this 
and I'm not looking at this, I'm looking only at this. But this is the general skin and uh, it's uh, easy to prove. And it's easy to prove also that this leads a heuristic evaluation function that is monotonic or consistent, that's a very desirable property. Then, so we, we compile, we generate, and then we do like a table lookup during search. Um, so the mini bucket heuristic is monotone, admissible, and compu it's pretty, once you run the algorithm, it is computed in linear time, you can fetch it from the table. The strength is dictated by the eye bound. If you ran high, high, you have an accurate heuristic, you low, it's low heuristic. So you have a higher eye bound, more pre processing, stronger heuristic, and less search. Uh, it, is, it allows total trade off between pre processing and search. And we experiment that this is recording on, some, on the early work on that. Now, uh, when we didn't have end of search, we tried everything uh, with branch and bound and best per search uh, on, various, uh, on various benchmarks. And this is just to illustrate what we saw, we, uh, this trade off that I'm uh, mentioning. This is on coding, random coding networks. Uh, you can see here that we ran all this algorithm with different I band, I band 2, I band 6, I band 10, I band 14 for branch and bound and depth for search. This is time. And these are two instances. And for when, when the I band is very low, you are not doing well at all. You are here. When the I band is higher in this instance, you, are, you can immediately do far better and as the I bound. But if the I bound is very high, you have this delay. But later on, you will get the solution faster. In this chart, it's hard to see the difference between best for search and depth for search. Maybe in this uh, the, uh, this one here, this is best first and bunch and bound with I bound equals six. And the black one are the best for search. So we see that the best for search are much better than the bunch and bound. We see it better even here. In this case, we see that it takes a while for the, when the I bound is 14, the preprocessing takes a while, so you don't get anything. But then, zoop, you get uh, very fast to the exact solution, uh, and the best person is doing it much better than the best for search. So this was uh, when we explored trees and not graphs, and uh, we are showing the cases where we put all the ball. So it's, it's, it was, it's very nice. Uh, but now there is a limit on top of end of search, and it's not much more involved. So in end, end of search, we can have this vision. This is our graph. This is the pseudo tree. So actually, bucket elimination can be viewed as if it is send messages on a tree, not on a linear tree. If you look at actually the, the graph. Uh, if we had the bucket of D here. Uh, and if we process it uh, completely, it will send a message here, and the bucket of E will send a message here. So actually, we are processing a tree. When we are doing the mini bucket and partitioning, some of the functions are going directly elsewhere. So we can, this is what happens when we do the mini bucket uh, on this structure here. So it is as it mimics the pseudo tree. We are say, sending messages up. These are the functions the mini bucket creates. And we, when we will do the search, we will consult these functions. But we, it's here what function to consult, uh, depending where you are in the end of search tree. We'll go hand in hand with the snow splitting, I think, right? So yeah. It's like you split that node. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's what we show here, the splitting idea. And also the pseudo tree is, 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 is uh, tightly connected with something of what we call bucket tree. The, I forgot when you asked this question originally, actually a good way of generating, it's the same answer. If I'm looking at how I'm uh, generating the, uh, processing the bucket elimination algorithm, we can see that there is a tree behind it, it's not necessarily a path. And this would be the pseudo tree. So there is a simpler answer to the answer that I answered earlier with the DFS. Uh, so uh, here is uh, this example. So now if I am uh, doing the search, so the, this is my pseudo tree, and I'm searching. Let's say that I'm assigning A is already assigning A, the value A, B, the value B, and C, the value C, and I want to know what is the heuristic at this point. Uh, and I can compute it, uh, the heuristic will be <coughs> ABC. The heuristic will be the functions that they send uh, from uh, a, a, this function here. 
the function uh, on the see this function here and this function here. So this the sum of these three functions will give me the heuristic evaluation function for uh, a, a, a this a this point that will be a lower bound on the exact evaluation function. So it's pretty easy. Uh, some more, let me now show you some more detailed evaluation of the search in this So again, we have these uh, problems, and I thought, I mean, just before this uh, tutorial, I thought it would be nice just to give a glimpse of what are this uh, benchmark, uh, what kind of problems we see. I don't know if it's uh, informative or not, but this is an example of the uh, typical pedigree. Uh, the easiest thing we have, this is the primal graph, and this would be the pseudo tree of this, uh, a pseudo tree. So you can just have an idea. We don't have all the backups here. Here is for grade. This is a, a, a grade um, a graphical model, and here is the pseudo tree for this. You can see how we have the things look. Uh, I, and what I neglected to say, look what is the surface. So the number of all nodes that we correspond to this pseudo tree is this number. And node is this number. For the grid, uh, this is the grid, this is the number of all nodes. If I if I cover the whole search space, we are not exploring the whole search space. And this is an, an example of PDP network, protein networks, and this is a pseudo tree, and these are the numbers for the search space, the context minimum search space. You can, see. You can also see what we, what kind of width. The width here is very small, it's A, but the domain size is very big, A1. The domain size is very big. In here, the width is 24. Uh, for this instance, the domain size is 2. Here is 15. The domain size is 4. So there is a variety of instances, and we ran all these branch and bound algorithm with these very different heuristics. Uh, um, and uh, we had some particular parameter for this iteration, FGLP and JGLP. All in pre the heuristics are created pre processing, not during search. Everything is done a priori, and then we do. The total search time is 24 hours, memory, and the eye bounds that we think about this three, and some results. So here you have the search time, and this four uh, variants. So you can see if we are doing search just with the mini bucket heuristic, the eye bound is here in 10. Yeah, we start an anytime time algorithm, so it's, it improves and we get up to here. But look at mini bucket with moment matching. It starts here and it's quite good. Uh, look at JGLP, which is the most uh, aggressive uh, heuristic. It starts here, so there is a delay. I don't think we see, but it can be the best uh, eventually. And FGLP by itself is not good, but if we combine it with JGLP, it's good. So this is actually typical for on all the instances. The mini bucket is, uh, uh, is far uh, less effective by itself. Uh, uh, compared to when you use these other uh, reparameterization schemes. Uh, from experience, NBMM is very effective, even though it's not that strong, but it balances well the pruning versus uh, the time that you have to do. JGLP yeah, yeah, is very strong, but it has overhead of the Not that difficult, uh, and you can see that the, the FGLP sometimes is doing well. This is the red is JGLP, so it almost immediately found the best solution. Okay, so this is search, and we saw that a good uh, a, uh, can be effective. Uh, just one slide or two slides about the combination search and inference and. Uh, no matter what you are doing, summation, optimization, we can always combine search and inference in the following way. We can do search up to a certain level. This decouples the graphical model because conditioning is as if it takes the variables out and makes the graph sparser. So you can consider doing search up to a point and then solve by variable elimination exactly uh, sparser problem. And it is to like the method that is called W classic conditioning, and you can decide ahead of time that you would, are willing to do inference 
when your induced width, conditional induced width is bounded by 10 or 20. And you can condition until you get to that point. So W is your bound? W is the bound on the processing of inference. And then, uh, and then you do search. It leads to new parameters you can ask. What is the structure I should, how can I find the W subset? which is how the conditioning effect can give me these, and there uh, are a variety of them. And we looked at these, those questions, and they possible to get a nice algorithm. But it is, general, it is a general framework that you can consider uh, for all these algorithms. And uh, it's hard to find the It's a gen in general how, but we have a, a heuristic algorithm. Here we have that, uh, and there is an end of the uh, W cuts. And all would mean that this part is an end of the composition, and then, and then in the leaves you are exactly different. Yes. Um, so all these things, I think, would be more effective to summation problems than to optimization, where the pruning of the search space by the function itself, by the objective function, is good. This is uh, so. This collection of algorithms here we call end or end or j. J is the maximum scope size that you can. It's also a trade-off between memory and time. Because if you have enough memory, you do the inference, and you operate here. When the, the when you up your j is the, the induced width, you have this complexity, time and space. When you don't have any memory, you are your bound is this uh, high uh, w star log n, and in between you can we can analyze exactly and say when the space will be bounded by this space parameter exponential in uh, j. And the time will be in between. The worst case time will be in between, and you can give it some meaning. Uh, so it's possible to think about this collection of algorithms and um, try to pick the, the, the good balance. Was that the question? You have more patience. Okay. So let me now move to the last part. Or almost last part, and try to also talk about the more challenging task. I talked about optimization, pure optimization, and I talked about pure summation. I almost didn't talk about it, but everything that I said that you think about, except you don't have pruning, you do branch and bound. There is no branch and bound. Uh, marginal method in infant diagram are uh, quite relevant to planning. Let me start with marginal method. So this is the picture. Uh, often you are not interested not in all the variables. You don't want to optimize, to find an optimal solution over all the variables, but just a subset of the variables. So in the, uh, the picture is, is this one. I mean, you have this graphical model, but you want to know the maximum value or some maximum over this variable, but the objective function actually that you're interested in is not given explicitly. It's actually only after you will sum over all these variables that are not, you're not interested in, you will get the function that you want to optimize. That's the marginal net. You want to marginalize the probability function so it will be a marginal only on this subset of variables, and now you want to find an optimal solution. And it's often what you want. So for example, if in planning, we often have a uh, decision variable. This is an influence diagram here. That is, you have it the time, you have the time steps, and then you need to choose actions at each time step. Where you have utility components. This is the state variable. This is a. Uh, this, this is our decision variable. This is the decision that you want to make. And these are the, the cost, the utility function, or cost function, and you also have uh, that you have here. And some uh, influence along the timeline, and some variables will be observed, uh, other will not be observed. But what you want is to find a collection of decisions that will maximize uh, either the probability of finally getting to the goal or the maximum expected utility uh, uh, if it's not just the probability to get to the goal. But in all these cases, you are interested to optimize over the decision variables only. So the uh, influence of uh, all the other variables need to be marginalized out before you are in the maximization. So, so in some of these cases, when we want 
to optimize, to uh, find a, a set of decisions that will maximize the probability of getting to the goal, this is marginal math. We played a little bit with this. Uh, we looked at uh, a, a different uh, conformal claim problems uh, described uh, PPDLL and translated them into graphical models and tried to solve them with marginal map algorithms. So here is just an example for a slipper, slipper and slipper case. Uh, you have this, this is the most uh, simplest uh, problem. You have data dry and something else. And these are uh, additional variables that you have to do. And you have to really find a, 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 a find the maximum probability, the, the, the assignment to the, to the actual variables that we maximize uh, this network. This is conformant probabilistic plan. Yes, conformant probabilistic plan. So we, we uh, actually, we had a paper that we sent here and was not accepted. Um, this, uh, our, our examples, are, I mean, uh, frankly, I can understand. I think the exercise that we did is very interesting. Actually, a master, a master thesis of my student. And, but empirically, you should have sent us to the workshop. Ah. HSP. Ah. Next slide. Okay, yeah. Yeah, probably I didn't think about it. Uh, but, uh, or didn't, didn't know about it either. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we have a miracle result that when we compared even with uh, FF or some, some other performance planning, there were instances that we did get. Yeah. We are solving this exactly. And those methods are not solving this exactly, but we were not so able exactly to exactly you mean you get optimal, optimal optimal probability, but we were unable to solve problems that are beyond the in block world are like three blocks uh, was most was the highest or something like that. So we definitely we uh, encountered the complexity issue associated with the modeling of the problem in that way. First of all, many many additional variables and so on. But uh, uh, in any case, the, this, ta this task is definitely relevant to this. So let's now Did talk. Did us approximation? Mm -hmm. We didn't get to it. Mm -hmm. No, we didn't get to it. Because we we won't. Often there is a parameter. You only have to succeed in some in the standard formulation. You have to saw to find a plan that solves with at least probability of something. Yes. I yeah. And it's I, yeah, necessary, yeah. not optimal. Yeah, I know. We looked at it. Uh, at this, at that point, all we had is the marginal map exact solver. Uh, we did. We simply didn't have. A, we solved it with heuristic evaluation function, but we didn't have this capability. I think we should continue. But I think uh, also we got a little bit discouraged because the complexity problem. I mean, it's hard to imagine that we will be competitive uh, with this approach. But it's uh, but it's very interesting. And uh, uh, I think we learned uh, uh, a lot about this uh, at that point. But so here is uh, what would be bucket elimination for marginal map. So we are now talking about the problem of, uh, here is an uh, illustration. So if I have this graphical model, I have two sets of variables. The variables that are the, the maximization variables that I'm interested in, A, B, and E, and the rest of the variables, the summation variables that I want to marginalize. I want to compute this. I want first to sum out the summation variable and then to maximize over the rest. And this algorithm is very well known. I mean, we, all we have to make sure is that the summation variable should appear first. We have to sum out this variable first. So the order that we uh, must use is restricted. But we, the bucket elimination algorithm is very simple. We sum out. We take the product in this case. Let's say, uh, yeah, we take the product, but we marginalize by summation and generate functions. This is for B and C, and for the maximization variables, we just do the uh, max of the product, and then we will have the exact value, and we can generate the exact solution. So we have the bucket elimination work, but it's far uh, worse than in the, in the normal case because. The uh, restriction that the summation variables have to appear first often create huge trees because you don't have the liberty to pick an ordering that is good. You have to force yourself for a bad ordering if you want to be exact. So here is the ordering that we use uh, for this uh, uh, small problem. So the induced width is 4 because we have to put B and C on top and then the rest. 
If we had the liberty to really uh, generate uh, any ordering, and we cho chose a good ordering, they used with this tool. This is a good ordering. And we, had we applied the fact elimination algorithm, we would get something. We would get an upper bound. So uh, this is a, 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 uh, was observed by the wish, and, uh, and it was led to good algorithms uh, uh, for marginal math, and later was picked up by hacks and students. Uh, to, as a source for creating heuristics. So uh, the heuristic is created by processing, by doing variable elimination on a relax mode. And you can use it. But uh, the observation is that the problem is harder because the ordering is restricted. Here is so what we explored, uh, the idea of doing search. And uh, using the mini bucket heuristic and our consistency in the implementation tools. This is recent work from the last two years. Uh, so here is a graphical model with Radu Maridescu uh, from IBM. So he, uh, here in this case, these are the optimization for the variables and these are the summation variables. So if you want to do the end of search, you must also restrict yourself. You cannot do things arbitrarily. You must have the initial suitably composed of the human simulation variables and the rest are the summation. So it's the same problem, but in search we have a lot of flexibility. So this is our pseudo tree that is legitimate for this task. The met variables appear first, the summation variables appear later. And this is a constraint tree. But now we can search this, this creature. Uh, so um, uh, this is, uh, for this problem, this is the end of context minimal search graph. So we have two types of variables, a met variable, the maximization, and some variables that are all variables that, that you assign values to. And, but we have also the end decomposition for, for both. Uh, here is, so in this example, I don't, the pseudo tree is not here, um, but it can be figured out, you can see that uh, we have merging, so we have decomposition to C and D uh, after A and B. You have this decomposition on the map variable. Uh, I don't see that we have any more uh, decomposition for this problem later on. We have merging for on F, on F, on, D, on, G, uh, on G, H, and uh, we have a lot of merging on H. No, but also we have the decomposition right. under D, G, F. D, And we have also the merging uh, by the context. And this would be the whole end of search graph that you will have to search. And now the, the, what you do is quite obvious. You do summation. When you get here uh, on this problem, recursively you do summation. And here, the optimization. So. You, if we are doing depth first and of search, we maintain the best solution cost L so far. So uh, we have, it's really tricky and you don't see it at first glance. We have to understand that we are doing search or branch and down only up to here, up to this level, because this is where we are doing optimization. From here on, we have to compute exactly in order to know what is the objective function. So we are solving exactly the summation sub uh, at this stage. So in order, so this is marginalization. This is marginalization. So we have to compute everything. Yes. You, 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 for, uh, for each condition part yes. on ABC, I have to solve the summation problem. Exactly. So in competition, we later participated in a competition last year. Uh, in our examples, we solved the problems. Generate the problems we generated uh, were okay, but we got to the competition very difficult. Problem. We were unable to generate a single solution because even to generate a single solution, you are solving the summation problem. But in the cases where the conditional and two suite is, is manageable, you can do that. Uh, and uh, but so you can do the branch and bound, and you prune only at all nodes that, of the map variables. Optimization one, cost of math assignment obtained by searching the corresponding sub problem with question. So, this we are just doing the, the usual search of the whole space. We have to search the whole space. So, we may have some pooling here, but if we are going below, we have to search everything. And, and the winning, winning algorithm or message passing based? 
So there are this, it was the first time that marginal map was uh, in the community. Uh, the only competitor were us. Oh, okay. <laughs> but we comp competed with ourselves once because there is a period where you, you get some feedback and we realize what the problem is. So we submitted our regular innovation algorithm to the marginal map because you can argue that that's all, uh, assume that we have a, a So we solve an optimization, we get an optimal solution on all the variables, okay. and we submit oh, all okay, the functions. Okay. So people are, are, are... So you do the actual MPE and you just uh, predict it? Okay. Because they did not require that we will say what is the cost. Okay. If they require that, we would not be able to okay. do it yeah. also. But they can, they were able to do it. So and that, this triggered us, uh, first of all, we did, this was the winning algorithm. Uh, and we realized that it's a good strategy also. I mean, it's definitely a competitor. Uh, and it, we realized also that we have to address the destination problem of proximity. This is the problem. But uh, uh, we were still, we were, we do it, we did this the first time. So the risk evaluation function that we was developed was also uh, quite sophisticated. Here is some information. So we did the mini bucket for marginal map. So uh, the idea is the same, you just um, uh, partition when you have to and you apply, if it's a summation bucket, you apply the summation operation, if not uh, the maximization. So it's fairly straightforward up to this point, but we also did the weighted mini bucket. So this comes the deparameterization uh, uh, scheme and uh, um, Alex Eiler and his student Lee developed weighted mini bucket, which is a scheme that is superior for summation problem. Superior because it uses holder inequalities. I don't have time to describe it, but each mini bucket is processed. You assign each mini bucket a weight, uh, that the sum of the weights to the mini bucket sums to one, and you are doing this operation, and this is a better approximation. And we use that scheme. Uh, in our approximation and got results. Uh, what we compared with in our papers, we compared to the earlier methods. So the earlier methods are by Fernando Wish and Hans, which improved, and they're doing search. They are doing much and much search when the heuristic evaluation function is the relaxed ordering. Namely, they are not restricted in the ordering. And here, uh, what I can show you, uh, how these are three classes of uh, benchmarks and out of the, the and this, I think it's the number of um, uh, problems that we are solving uh, within a timeline. Uh, the, 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 if the uh, headers are all algorithms, really better than the previous algorithms, not always, but in many cases. Uh, but again, I mean, the bottleneck that I mentioned is uh, uh, is real. And we are now trying to work on that. So the heuristic is generated by the weighted mini bucket with moment matching heuristic and so on. So we put all the things that we did before into this task. And um, we have an extension of this paper to any time algorithm in each guy this year. But these are just further results. Here it's easier to see uh, as a function of the IBAM, all these algorithms. This is the log median CPU. And this is also the log median CPU on two, two classes of instances. Uh, and um, the uh, lower is better. So our algorithm is sort of in the bottom. And uh, you see here how it functions as a function of the I band. Not always it's uh, getting better with increased I band because of overhead and things like that. So we are working on improving the any time behavior, and especially the summation. Uh, last thing is influence diagrams. I don't have that much to say about it. Let's let's uh, uh, look at an influence diagram. In general, this is what you want to compute: the maximum expected utility. So the function is you have mix, uh, uh, decision variables that you want to maximize over, and you have. Uh, state variables that are observed and state variables that are not observed. Uh, and you have probabilistic functions that are associated. So here, this is a uh, very well-known example of O3. Uh, 
So we are working on that. I don't have any results to show, but I think uh, we also have ideas of how to do the with the heuristic mini vacuum. Okay, so that last thing is uh, start a little bit about software. I don't remember what I have here. So we won with the uh, uh, most powerful explanation. We won the last, last few calls. The, computa the competition that was in 2012, uh, we won uh, in uh, two of the three categories. And in the competition that was in 2014, became, I think, second place with the same solver. So the student who worked on this solver is Lars Otten. Um, most of the work is, the core work is uh, based on Radu Marinesco, who developed the original algorithm. And Lars Otten, uh, my student that uh, graduated in 2012, he worked on, on parallelization of this algorithm. On the way of doing parallelization, he redeveloped this algorithm by itself again, and he entered the competition, and uh, he also uh, developed a version of the algorithm that is anytime, that works well anytime. So just a, a glimpse, this is just a summary of uh, the various things. We have decomposition, we have caching. We worked a lot on ordering, so I mentioned it in passing, that ordering is important, I didn't say Wow, what do you do about it? And it's well known in the community. There are several greedy algorithms that works well, like Mayfield. But we decided that it's time to really invest on this issue. And we, uh, my Caleb Kass uh, was also my student, and now he's working uh, with us again. He developed the algorithm. You regenerate the ordering, and you do things effectively, and you uh, and, uh, do stochastic. Uh, uh, methods and until you get a good ordering. So this graph sh shows that if you are doing the mean field, you can get many, the variance can be very big, so it's worthwhile to, to do it repetitively. And this is now the ordering algorithm that we use in competitions. We also had this anytime idea. It's something that people don't think about, the only competition for this stuff. When you have, there's a bunch of money is inherently anytime. When you have end all, it's not inherently any time. Because you are going to solve one subponent exactly before you will go to the other. If you do it brute force, if you don't think about it. So if you have a branch, I mean you want to solve the subponent that is rooted in A, you will not get to the subponent that is rooted in D before you solve that one exactly. So it's not any time anymore if the if you the first problem that you encounter is how. So in order to convert our algorithm to any time we uh, develop this breath rotate uh, that's for search that we jump from one subproblem to another and uh, this is the end of branch a breath rotate end of branch and bar that we use in competitions and all these heuristics and uh, we won um, so it's a good algorithm uh, in, the, in the next second round we didn't we, we got second place but without doing anything. Normally you need to tune, you need to improve, and so on. We have a library of uh, algorithms uh, for likelihood. This is the, the, um, uh, the this is for the optimization for likelihood, for marginal map we are developing, an approximation algorithm that are spelled out here, mini bucket I talked about, uh, and other sampling algorithms. You are welcome to uh, look at the website. Uh, this is the variable ordering algorithm. These are my students. This is my first book, and this is my second book. This thing, um, many of the things that I talked about uh, appear here. In the constraint book, chapter 13, they are relevant. Also here. Thank you very much.